Welcome to the Weightlifting Encyclopedia Video Companion, Techniques and Methods of Olympic Style Weightlifting. We created this video to serve a broad field of weightlifting as that term is used by the general public, but more importantly to do an in-depth study of the sport of Olympic Style Weightlifting. Shrouded in mystery since its inception, Olympic Style Weightlifting is probably the best kept secret in sports and fitness training today. Weightlifters are truly superior athletes lifting as much as three times their body weights overhead. They're seemingly rivaled only by the power, skill, speed, flexibility, and mental focus of these tremendous athletes. It's a great sport and fascinating for its own sake. Very practical applications. What can be viewed as kind of a NASA program for fitness training and sports readiness training. The rewards of weightlifting are strength, power, flexibility, increases in muscle mass, increases in metabolism, increases in bone mass, all of which combine to help an older athlete fight the ravages of aging. And there's a great pleasure in mastering the skill associated with weightlifting and with the immediate feedback one gets when one is lifting weights. It's a complex and difficult sport, but as a result, when one succeeds, the satisfaction is tremendous. It's an individual sport, but there's a tremendous camaraderie among lifters in their mutual fight against the barbell. It's truly a unique sport overall. And now, through the Weightlifting Encyclopedia book and video, secrets of Olympic style weightlifting and the Olympic champions of weightlifting are secrets no more. The Weightlifting Encyclopedia video companion offers an introduction to weightlifting and weight training, covers the elements of Olympic style weightlifting technique, assistance exercises for the Olympic lifts, the technical rules of the snatch and the clean and jerk, learning and teaching weightlifting technique, and using equipment effectively. Each section of the video builds upon the prior ones. We recommend that you watch the entire video before attempting to apply any of its advice with your coach. The Weightlifting Encyclopedia book covers the quantitative aspects of technique, strength, power, and flexibility training, assistance exercise evaluations, using equipment effectively and the technical rules of weightlifting, mental training, and, and preparation for competitions, how athletes cope with weightlifting injuries, nutrition and sports science, and the use of Olympic style lifts and related exercises to improve performance in other sports. Before exploring weightlifting and weight training any further, I want to clear up a few fallacies. First, Olympic style weightlifters are the strongest athletes alive. They're stronger than bodybuilders like Arnold Schwarzenegger, pro football players, pro wrestlers, world's strongest man competitors, and I would argue even powerlifters. While weightlifting and powerlifting both measure strength very effectively, in weightlifting, we have an Olympic Games and only one governing body for the entire sport throughout the world. So when we say there's a world champion, they're the very best athletes in the world. We also have hundreds of thousands of competitors around the world. It's much more widely spread than the sport of powerlifting. So the level of competition is simply higher. Uh, I'm not saying that every weightlifter is stronger than every powerlifter by any means, but that as a group, the level of competition is just tougher in weightlifting. And further, in weightlifting, there are no supportive devices that are used while lifting, whereas in powerlifting, lifters are relied to a great extent on special assistive equipment that they wear. And so there are times when the athlete who has the best equipment can be an athlete who is stronger but has inferior equipment or does not have the technique to use it properly. So I believe that overall, weightlifters do face the toughest test test of any athletes in the world when it comes to strength and power. Now, to understand why weightlifters are the strongest, one needs to understand the fact that size does not equal strength. Well, an athlete can appear to have very large muscles and really not be very strong compared to another who is much smaller in appearance but trains specifically for strength as weightlifters do. Now, some other fallacies surrounding weightlifting are that they, it causes hernias, bad backs, and knees, and while we certainly have these injuries on occasion, uh, no more so than other strenuous sports, and actually often quite a bit less than other sports. Weightlifting does not stunt growth. That's a silly fallacy. There's no evidence, whatever, that that's the case. Drug use is not rampant in weightlifting. Drug testing, in fact, is tougher in weightlifting than in almost any other sport around the world. Weightlifters can be tested year-round without notice, and so it's very hard for them to take illegal drugs and not be caught. 
And finally, Bill Winters were often accused of being muscle bound. That's a total fallacy. Uh, the sports scientists came to a recent Olympic Games and tested all the athletes in the games, and Wade Winters finished second only to gymnasts in their flexibility. Among those who train with weights, there are essentially five realms of activity. First, there is weight training or resistance training for general or specific fitness, the latter generally for preparation for a particular sport. This includes a wide variety of exercises that are performed with exercise machines and with free weights, such as barbells. Such training can improve one's strength, power, muscle size, flexibility, bone density, and muscular endurance. It can even improve one's cardiovascular conditioning if weight training exercises are done in sequence with little rest between those exercises. Second, there is weight training for rehabilitation for everything ranging from joint injuries to myocardial infarctions. Third, there is the sport of bodybuilding. Bodybuilding is a sport in which the competitors are judged solely on the basis of their appearance. Competitors train to develop very large muscles in balanced proportions throughout the body and on the minimization of body fat. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Lou Ferrigno, Steve Reeves, Lee Haney, Corey Yearson, and Linda Murray are all examples of bodybuilders. Bodybuilders are extremely dedicated athletes. They train very hard and they diet more carefully than virtually all other athletes in the world. And it is through their efforts that we see what the limits of human capacity are in terms of muscular development, the minimization of body fat, and the artistic display of the human body. However, what the public often does not understand is that bodybuilders, despite the huge appearance of their muscles, are not the ultimate strength athletes. They are far stronger than the average person, but they are not, as a group, nearly as strong as the athletes who are in the last two categories of weight trainers, powerlifters, and Olympic-style weightlifters. Powerlifting was devised as a sport to test pure strength. Powerlifters compete in three lifts, the squat, bench press, and the deadlift, in that order. In the squat, the lifter lowers the body by bending the legs until the tops of the thighs are just below knee level, and then the lifter stands up by fully straightening the legs. We've invited three-time Women's World Powerlifting Champion, Linda Jo Belcito, to demonstrate the power lifts. The bench press is the second lift in powerlifting competition. In this event, the lifter lies on his or her back and a barbell is removed from a set of supports and the lifter is given the signal to lower the bar. Right. The lifter pauses at the chest and then presses immediately. Right. In the deadlift, the bar begins on the floor in front of the lifter's legs. From that position, the bar is lifted from the floor until the body is fully erect. The lifter who lifts the most on all three lifts combined is the winner of powerlifting competition. Weightlifting is the only sport involving the use of weights that is part of the Olympic Games, which is why it is often referred to as Olympic-style weightlifting. The sport of weightlifting was conceived as the ultimate means to compare the strength of athletes worldwide. It consists of two events in which the athlete lifts a barbell overhead. In the first event, a barbell is lifted from the floor overhead in one incredibly explosive motion. Because the lift is performed so quickly and explosively, it is called a snatch. The second event of weightlifting competition is called a clean and jerk. In this event, the barbell is lifted from the floor to the shoulders. Then the athlete pauses and with the legs and arms thrusts the bar overhead. The clean and jerk is the greatest single test of human strength and power ever conceived, which is why it is often referred to as the king of the lifts. Today in weightlifting, athletes from up to 160 nations compete annually at the World Championships. There, men and women battle to determine who the world's strongest man or the world's strongest woman is. Every four years, the most elusive of all sports prizes, Olympic gold, is at stake. We left them contested in several bodyweight classes so that athletes of different sizes can compete with peers. There are eight weight classes for men and seven for women. There are also age group competitions so that, for example, teenagers can compete with one another and athletes who are age 35 or above can compete against each other in five-year age brackets. In this way, throughout your career, you can compete against athletes of the same age, size, and gender. As both of these popularity grew, it was learned that training could dramatically improve an athlete's performance. So much so that a gifted natural athlete, one who began very strong, could be defeated rather easily by a better trained athlete. 
Moreover, it was noticed that the ability to improve is relatively independent of one's pre-training strength. So a very strong athlete at the beginning may not improve as quickly as an athlete who starts with lesser strength. Now that's still true in the sport of weightlifting today, and weightlifters often improve as much as 300% or more in their original strength. The subject of training for super strength is covered in the weightlifting encyclopedia of the book. The focus of this video is on the development of technique which really was the second breakthrough in weightlifting development, when it was really recognized that efficient technique was critical to performance. Today, performance levels are so high that proper technique is mandatory. However, because most top athletes have very efficient technique, it's still the strongest and the most powerful weightlifter who generally wins. In the sport of weightlifting, we use terms for the different parts of a lifter's body that resemble some of the medical terms or shorthand means for that. We're going to use some of those terms during the video, so I want to explain what we're referring to now. When we talk about the delts, we mean the lifter's shoulders. We talk about the biceps, the pecs, the abdominal muscles, the muscles that uh, ripple in the stomach. We have the quads, which are the four muscles that are on the front of the thigh. The adductor or groin area of the lifter. And then if we turn down around, we have the trapezius muscles that raise the shoulders. We have the lats, the triceps. Here this is the lower back. The muscles that run across the spine are known as the spinal erector muscles. And then we have the buttocks, the hamstrings, and the calves. Those are all the things that we're going to be referring to during the course of the uh, video. The concept of the lever is an important one for weightlifters. It consists of a rigid object to which force is applied. In this case, my forearm is the lever, and the force is supplied by my bicep muscle, which is attached to the forearm here. The second part of the lever is the fulcrum. The fulcrum is a pivot point around which the lever moves, in this case, my elbow. The last component of the lever is a resistance arm. In this case, my forearm, with the resistance being supplied by this plate. One of the principles of a lever is that the further away the resistance is from the fulcrum, the more difficult it will be to move that resistance. In contrast, the closer the resistance to the fulcrum, the easier it will be to lift that resistance. Now, the principle of a lever applied to actually lifting a barbell says that if my torso is the lever and my hip joints form the fulcrum I'm concerned with, the further away the bar is from that fulcrum, the more difficult to lift. So if the bar travels away from my body, there's far more stress on my back than if I keep the bar in close to the body. So the whole basis of weightlifting technique is to keep the bar and the body as close to one another throughout the lift as is possible. So when you see a lifter lifting, you're going to see the bar coming close to the shins, close to the body, all the way up as close as possible. The center of gravity represents the point of intersection of three lines of gravity. Let's explain. So in the case of this board, this vertical line is the line of gravity up and down of this particular object. What it really says is the object weighs an equal amount on either side of this line, and this is exactly in the center of its weight. We draw another line from side to side that splits the object in that way, and the intersection of these two lines is where the exact center of this object is. Now the reason this is important is that an object only stays in balance when the center of its gravity, which it would be this point here, remains within the extremes, the outer edges of the object. So if I tilt this board and this center line goes outside the bottom of this, the board will fall that way. It'll go outside. So when the center of this object moves, it'll go outside that level and the board falls that way. When the center is maintained within the confines of the outer edges of this object. If I let it go back, it will fall back into place. We've taken some license with the center of gravity concept by ignoring the line of gravity of this board front to back, but we'll do that now in discussing a lifter's center of gravity. Yeah. The center of gravity of the human body is basically at the level of the navel and from front to back in the center of the body. 
So if I'm trying to maintain my balance and I allow my, the center of my body to travel outside my base of support, which in my case is the feet, I'm not going to be able to sustain my balance. If I let that go behind my heels, I'm not going to be able to sustain my balance in that way either. Now when a lifter is interacting with the barbell, the center of gravity is a combination of the lifter's body's center of gravity and the barbell center of gravity. So when I hold an object here, my center of gravity of the combined body and bar shift somewhat forward. They're still within my body, but they're shifted forward of where they were uh, when my body was not holding this bar. And the heavier the bar, the closer the combined center of gravities would move toward each other. And my, the weight would take greater precedence. So if I were holding a weight two times my body weight, the center of gravity of the combined body and bar would be much closer to the bar than to my body. Now the reason for this importance of this is that the combined center of gravities of the bar and the body must stay within the confines of the feet. If the lifter allows the bar to go too far forward <clears throat> and it pulls the center of gravity combined forward, you're going to lose balance uh, forward. If you allow it to come back too far this way, you're going to lose balance behind. So maintaining one's balance over the feet is very critical in weightlifting technique. And it may move during a lift, and in fact does move during a lift, from the middle of the foot at the start of the lift, when one is assuming the beginning position, the combined center of gravity is in the middle. As one comes up, it shifts back toward the heels. And then as you complete the pull, it shifts back forward toward the toes. But excessive movements in any direction will cause the lifter to lose balance forward, which will mean they'll end up jumping forward. Or if you shift it too far back, you'll end up jumping back. So maintaining that balance is very, very important. When a lifter is viewed from his or her left side, it can be seen that the bar moves in an S-shaped curve. Despite its intricacies, this pattern of bar movement represents a reliable technique. There is a shift in the lifter's balance during the lift from the middle of his feet at the start to the rear of his feet as the bar moves toward the thighs, then toward the toes as the lifter explodes to throw the bar upward. Finally, the bar curves back toward the lifter as he catches it overhead. This lifter has an unusually narrow S-shape to his pull as he lifts the bar in a nearly straight pattern, keeping the combined center of gravities of the body and the bar close to one another and relatively stable throughout the entire lift. This lifter has a forward tilt to his S-pull as he begins with his combined center of gravities toward the front of his feet and his balance remains forward of what is typical throughout the lift. This requires him to jump forward to control the lift overhead at the end. This lifter has a backward tilt to his S-pull as he begins by shifting his balance rearward from the start. This causes him to jump back to control the bar at the end. A more conventional S-pull is generally more reliable than backward or forward tilted S's. In the jerk, the bar has a relatively straight pattern unless the lifter allows the bar to pull him or her forward during the dip. However, there is a backward motion to the bar. The end is the lifter interacts with the bar, pushing it overhead and thrusting the torso forward. In analyzing each of the lifts, it's helpful to break them down into six stages. Stage one of the snatch or clean consists of all the movements a lifter performs prior to taking the bar from the floor. We'll show you a variety of techniques that lifters use later in the video. Stage 2 starts when the bar leaves the floor. In stage 2, the legs lift the bar and the torso angle remains the same. It ends when the legs finish straightening here. At this stage in the snatch, the bar is above the knees and the lifter begins an explosive straightening of the torso which drives the knees forward and down under the bar in this kind of position. Stage 4 is the crucial explosion phase of the lift, which will throw the bar high enough for it to be secured overhead. Here, an explosive combination of the legs, hips, and back to the exploring, the arms aren't used. Until stage five, the lifter jumps down and first pulls and pushes himself under the bar with the arms while contacting the platform forcefully with the feet. This phase ends when the bar has reached its maximum height in the pull. During stage six, the lifter is working to bring the bar under control so that he can rise from the deep squat position with the bar comfortably overhead. 
Stage 6 ends when the downward motion of the bar has been fully arrested. Now the lifter stands up until the legs are fully straight, the feet in the bar in line with one another, and motionless, whereupon a referee signals the lifter to return the bar to the platform. The technique of the clean is similar to the snatch, but the lifter begins with the hips higher and the torso more upright because of the closer grip in the clean. Stage 2 proceeds as in the snatch and ends when the legs have straightened as much as they will during this early phase of the pull. But the bar is usually closer to knee level in the clean versus above the knee in the snatch when this phase ends. Here. Stage 3 usually has less knee rebend than in the snatch and ends here. The explosion phase is similar ending here. Stage 5 begins when the lifter starts moving under the bar and ends when the bar has reached its maximum height. Here. During stage 6, the lifter works to bring the bar into control and stop its downward progress. It ends when the bar has reached its lowest point. Here. Then the lifter stands up. In the jerk, stage 1 consists of the movements the lifter does to position the body and bar for bending the legs in stage 2. Stage 2 ends when the lifter begins to resist the downward motion of the bar. In stage 3, the lifter stops the bar's downward motion. In stage 4, he drives the bar upward explosively. In stage 5, the feet begin to move and the bar reaches its maximum height. In stage 6, the lifter holds the downward progress of the bar. Lifters use a number of methods to prepare for lifting the bar from the floor. Some start with the hips high and lower them before pulling. Others begin with the hips low, then raise them before pulling, while still others pump the hips up and down several times before they begin. All of these techniques are attempting to exploit the principle that the leg muscles will contract more forcefully if they are stretched before they are contracted. The same principle is being employed in the dive style. In this style, the lifter positions the body, then simply reaches down, grips the bar, and lifts it immediately. Finally, in the static start, the lifter positions the body carefully and pauses. This facilitates a more precise start, but trades off the pre-stretch advantage. Once the stage one preparations have taken place, some lifters position the hips rather low at the start, while others begin with the hips relatively high. Either approach within the range shown can work, with lower hips placing relatively more stress on the legs and less on the back, and the higher hip position having the opposite effect. Hip positions in the range we are demonstrating here work for the clean, but it should be noted that the lower the hips, the greater is the tendency to have the balance too far back at the start, with higher hips having the opposite effect. Something in between works best for most lifters. Regardless of the pre-start method a lifter employs, just before the ball leaves the platform, all lifters should have the bar positioned over the base of the toes and against or near the shins. The shoulders should be above or slightly forward of the bar, the traps relaxed, the chest puffed out after taking a partial breath, the torso rigid, the back locked in position with the lower back arched, the arms straight and relaxed, and some lifters find it helpful to flex the lats and push back somewhat with the arms. Some lifters perform stage two of the pull relatively slowly. Their bar velocities will be as much as 40 to 50 percent higher during the explosion phase of the pull and during stage two. Other lifters will pull rapidly from the floor. Their bar velocities will be similar in stages two and four of the pull. Most lifters, particularly beginners, find a slower start and enables them to maintain a correct pulling position more easily. Lifters vary with regard. Lifters vary in the degree to which they rebend their knees during their third or amortization phase of the pull. Some rebend a great deal as this lifter does here. He also rises on the toes as he rebends his knees. Many lifters do not. Lifters who rebend their knees a great deal get a greater leg drive in their pulls than lifters who do not. But they lose more bar speed during the third or amortization stage of the pull then lifters who bend their knees less, as this lifter does, so th there is a trade-off.
Recognize that rebending is not typically a conscious action, rather it results from thinking of straightening the torso rapidly and or driving the hips and thighs forward into the bar. The rebend phenomenon occurs in the clean as well as the snatch, but it's generally shorter in duration and less profound in its effect in the clean. This literature demonstrates a relatively long rebend. A small rebend helps the lifter retain more of the momentum generated in stage two of the pull, and this is helpful in this shorter duration pull of the clean relative to the snatch. At this point, we want to provide some tips for the proper execution of the all-important explosion phase of the pull. You begin this phase with the shoulders directly above the bar, and the bar and the shoulders are in line with the base of the toes. During the explosion, the weight shifts forward toward the toes. Some lifters rising up as much as this on the toes, some being rather flat. But the weight, body weight is shifting forward as the hips drive forward and the back straightens up. There's a conscious maximal effort. Some people think of hitting the bar with the traps. But what you have to watch out for at this stage is for a bounce out where a lifter comes up, is driving the hips forward, is driving them forward so much that he bounces the bar or she bounces the bar away from the body. We don't want to see a lot of bouncing away from the body. There's going to be some forward travel of the bar, but it should not be excessive. The bar should really be brushing against the thighs or the hips and mainly moving in a vertical position as the back straightens, the torso straightens, and the hips move forward. Now, vertical is the key here. We want to get as much vertical movement as we can and not too much horizontal. The legs, hips, and the back are locked together in position, and the athlete is using the combination of all those parts of the body to explode upward. Now, at this point, there's often some discussion among coaches as to whether the coach should teach the lifter to actually bounce the bar against the thighs. Now, it should be more or less of a natural reaction. If the lifter is straightening the torso and driving the hips forward at the explosion phase of the pull, the thighs will normally come in contact with the bar because the hips are moving forward, the bar is moving close to the body, and there should be a collision of the bar and the hips at some point during this motion. But some lifters actually have to be taught to bounce the bar or to touch the bar with the thighs. Now the only question here is that if you teach a lifter just to pull it up and to bang, they can knock the bar forward, they can lose all sense of what they're trying to accomplish, which is the upward propulsion of the bar, not just banging the bar against the body. It's not a horizontal kind of emotion. But some lifters need to be taught to drive the hips forward. They don't typically do that. They sit back on the heels, they raise the body like this, and they get no forward motion with the hips at all. So, it has to be adapted for the lifter. It can be a mistake to emphasize just banging too much. For other lifters, it's essential. Some learn it, some don't, without being taught to actually concentrate on doing it. But that is the kind of emotion that is going to occur when the pull is being done properly. It is incredibly important to explode maximally during the explosion phase of the pull and to fully straighten the legs and back. But pausing the extended position or stretching high up on the toes had limited value, as any extra pull I gained by doing so is largely neutralized because the lifter could have otherwise moved under the bar sooner to stop its downward fall and bring it under control. This lifter has a very efficient finish, barely straightening the legs. Note that this lifter did not rise in his toes, nor did he bend his arms. Rather, he used the powerful muscles of his legs and back to lift the bar very efficiently and then moved rapidly under the bar. The lifter shown in the prior scene has been a world record holder in the snatch, as has this lifter. However, this lifter extends the body significantly more. He gets more height in the pull, but he takes more time to get under the bar. Both styles work, but any extension beyond the point of this lifter's style is probably a waste of time. Even this lifter, while rising significantly on the toes, does not use the arms and moves very rapidly under the bar. This is an example of an extension that is simply too long. The lifter is too high in the toes and is pulling until the arms are bent. As a result, the bar rises relatively little after the lifter has finished pulling and the bar is falling well before the lifter is in a position to stop it. This clean and jerk world record maker and two-time Olympic champion has an extremely efficient clean technique. He pulls with incredible explosiveness but does not rise on the toes and barely straightens the legs. After finishing his pull, he moves under the bar extremely rapidly 
and assumes an incredibly good position with high elbows and the chest out, the back rigid. He then catches a rebound from the bottom of the clean and rises out of that. And finally at the end, he manages to clear the bar slightly off the chest, which allows him to set his body properly for the jerk. Clean technique doesn't get much better than this. Rising on the toes a bit and extending the legs a bit more than the previous lifter can still be efficient, but this lifter clearly pulls too long. She may have gotten extra height by pulling longer, but this lifter is giving up a lot of valuable time going under the bar with her overextension. Many lifters think very little about moving their bodies under the bar to receive the bar. They devote their full focus to exploding, to pulling very hard on the bar, to driving it hard on the jerk, and then they just rely on intuition to float underneath the bar. And this is a major technical mistake. The focus and the effort to go under the bar must be nearly as great as the focus to raise the bar up in the first place. Moving under the bar effectively requires an interaction with the bar, as well as a focus on moving under it with great speed. In the snatch and the clean, the lifter must pull himself or herself under, almost rebounding from the pull or rebounding from the shrug. So when the lifter snaps the shoulders, that causes an immediate effect to drop down underneath the bar. You have to think of jumping down or moving down with maximum speed underneath the bar. In the snatch, pushing out. Pushing on the arms will help drive you to the bottom position in the snatch, lock the bar out solidly at the same time, get the bar under control. In the clean, it's the elbow speed. It's pulling and smooth, whipping the elbows very quickly. The very act of raising the elbows rapidly pushes the body underneath the bar, helps to make the body upright, keep the chest out, and that is going to drive the lifter down into a good position underneath the bar. And in the jerk, it's pushing the body away from the bar and at the same time pushing up on the bar to lock it out. You're <clears throat> placing the feet very explosively. When a lifter is lifting, you'll hear a top level lifter make an explosive sound when they hit the floor. And that's not because they're jumping up in the air and having a lot of air time so they can get a big slap. It's because they're moving the feet very quickly, just slightly off the ground and banging into that uh, low position. The quicker you hit that low, low position, the sooner the force from the floor will drive back up through your body and help stop the bar's downward force. So it's very, very critical. <clears throat> there should be no air time at all or as little air time as is possible and very, very rapid movement moving under the bar. Overall, you've got to think huge speed going under the bar, and that is really one of the great keys to making a successful lift. When a lift looks snappy because the bar is flying overhead, it's not because the bar is going up so fast, it's because the lifter is moving under it very, very quickly. This lifter shows great speed going under the bar. Notice how rapidly he throws himself under the bar, and how energetically he replaces his feet after pulling. This lifter goes under the bar with far less energy and speed than the prior lifter. Here's an example of efficient cleaning technique with very little bar descent. Here is a lifter who moves under the bar much more slowly. One of the best indicators of sound technique is the coordination of the explosion phase and the squat under in such a way that there is minimal bar drop. That the bar drops very little as the lifter goes underneath the bar. The minimum bar drop not only shows efficiency in the transition from the explosion to the squat under, but it also minimizes the force of the bar in the lifter's body when the bar descends on the lifter's body, so it really saves wear and tear on the lifter. The keys to getting minimum bar drop are greater bar velocity at the beginning of the squat under, which gives the lifter more time to descend, and it's greatest after you explode in the very strongest points. If you explode in the quarter squat position, the pro proper explosive position that we showed earlier, and then you're going to get maximum explosion on the bar. If you stay with the bar too long, stretch the body, and try to pull in a higher position with the arms, then you're going to be in a position where you're not going to be able to give it as much force. The speed of the bar is not going to be as great, and it's going to fall sooner as you go under it, and so you're not going to have uh, that minimal bar drop. It's going to go much longer. A faster descent under the bar is also a key. The less time the bar has to fall, then the less time there is for it to drop, and so the bar drop will be minimal. 
obviously thinking fast, interacting with the bar, and having minimum amplitude in the extension of the pull that gives you maximal pull are other keys. And finally, alertness is bringing the bar under control. It's not just the transition, but it's also how quickly do you become alert enough to stop the bar once you've come underneath it. A lot of lifters will get under the bar relatively quickly, but then it takes them some time to get the bar comfortably on the shoulders and the clean or to lock it out in the snatch. You've got to learn to push it right out in the snatch or in the jerk or in the clean to get the elbows up quickly and to contact the bar with the shoulders as quickly as possible. All of those things are going to tend to minimize bar drop, bring it under the bar under control rapidly, minimize wear and tear, and minimize the, uh, any excess effort the lifter is going to have to make. This lifter has a very small bar drop in the snatch, a highly efficient style. This lifter has a less efficient technique. Notice how much the bar descends on her before she can bring it under control because of her long extension and relatively slow movement under. This lifter exhibits relatively small bar drop in the clean because he does not overly extend and moves extremely rapidly under the bar. Here is an example of excessive bar drop in the clean. It should be noted that this is a world-class lifter who may be having an off day technically, but if she corrects these errors, she will lift even more. Okay, and holding a snatch overhead, some of the key points are that the elbows are uh, structured so that the crook of the elbow is pointing forward slightly, not directly up. The shoulder blades are pulled together. The athlete is actually pushing outward somewhere on the bar, trying to stretch the bar as they're in the uh, bottom position. The wrists are held uh, well back, and the bar is in line with the rear of the head. Uh. In the front, we can see the chest out, back arched, bar to the rear of the head, and thighs against the calves. The ears are solidly locked. In this excellent bottom position, the elbows are up. The elbows should never be near the knees. The torso is vertical or upright. The chest is out, the back is arched, and the thighs are against the calves, which assists in the lifter getting up from the clean. If the feet are too wide and the thighs travel in between the calves, it is much more difficult to recover from the squat position. Lifters should stand up from the low position and clean as soon as they have control in order to harness the stretch reflex. When they have difficulty standing up despite this, some lifters lean forward or actually round the upper body when recovering from the clean. Such lifters need to develop more leg strain so that this will no longer be a problem. We spent most of this video discussing the squat style, the snatch, and the clean. But there's another way of lowering the body. And in fact, it was the dominant style of lifting until the 1960s, and that's the split style. Now, in the split style, your shoulders need less flexibility than they do in the squat style. And you also need less flexibility in the wrist, particularly in the clean. It's, you can reach the bottom position faster in the split. You can move more quickly into the low split position than you can in the low squat. You have more control forward and backward because one leg is forward and one leg is back. You can control your balance going forward and back more easily. It's easier to recover from the low position and the clean when you have a split position versus a squat position. Now, we're saying some of those advantages or disadvantages. There's much more stress and strain on the groin muscles when one is in a split position than in a squat. And there's an uneven pressure on the legs and back. One leg is forward, one leg is back. There tends to be a little twisting in the back as a result of that. You can't go quite as low. So there are counterbalances, and that's why most of the lifters today are doing a squat style because they can go lower and they do have even pressures on the body. And they've developed enough strength to come out of their cleans even in a squat style. So now we're going to demonstrate the split style. We have Arnold Coughlin, former national champion of the Soviet Union and now many-time world masters champion. 
demonstrating a split snatch. He begins to lift in the same way as a squat lifter, but when descending into the bar, moves one foot forward and one foot back. The back leg moves about one and a half times as much as the front leg. He lands on the front foot flat-footed and the back foot on his toes. Arnold bends his arms when he's pulling because when he began lifting, it was against the rules to touch the thighs, and lifters pull with that kind of technique. Today, lifters pull with straight arms. Arnold will now demonstrate the split style in the clean. His best lifts, by the way, are 100 kilos in the snatch, or 220 pounds, and 130 kilos in the clean jerk, 286 pounds, at a body weight of 56 kilos, or 123 pounds. Arnold goes lower than the position he is demonstrating with heavy weight. At more than 70 years of age, he demonstrates that lifters can keep on going and going. Arnold will show us the clean one more time in the split style. The split is truly a majestic style. Okay, generally, lifters inhale somewhat just before a lift or while lowering the weight and inflate their chest somewhat when they breathe. So Patty inflates her lungs before she, somewhat before she squats, chest out, and then does the squatting exercise. Athletes exhale at the end or after a lift, or in the case of the explosion during the explosion phase. After the clean, lifters typically take a few quick breaths and hold the last before dipping their legs. And they exhale during the fifth stage or after the been done. If you walk into any commercial gym, you'll see people gripping the bar with the fingers and the thumb on the same side. The hand can easily slip with this kind of grip, so it should never be used for any exercise, especially bench pressing. And the next grip is the normal overhand grip, where the fingers wrap around the bar, the thumb comes around the bar from the other direction, and presses down typically on at least one of the fingers. This is the most common grip used, and it's fine for many exercises, but it's not the strongest. The premier grip for weightlifting is the hook grip, where the thumb is placed first around the bar, and then one, two, or even three fingers are placed over the thumb, pressing the thumb against the bar. The hook grip is significantly stronger than the normal grip and should be used for heavy snatches and cleans. Uh, some lifters use a normal grip while practicing in their lighter weights to build a grip, but the hook grip is the grip of choice for heavy lifts. Now the major drawback of the hook grip is that it can hurt when you begin to use it because the thumbs are placed between the bar and the fingers and so the fingers squeeze against the thumb and compress it. This can cause pain and even some discoloration of the thumbs due to damaged capillaries in the thumbs when the lifter first begins to use the grip. However, after a few weeks, discomfort dissipates, the tendency for skin discoloration is reduced or eliminated, and although the breaking in period can be somewhat unpleasant, the hook grip is mandatory for high performance. Many lifters own hook or return to a normal grip as they flip the wrist over in the snatch or the clean. See what happens naturally or it doesn't. If it is not, the lifter should unhook after cleaning the bar. We're now going to give some guidance about selecting the proper grip in a snatch. Now, with a wide grip, a lifter will find that the bar will be lifted that much higher simply by standing up. Okay, my grip now is wide, actually too wide for me. The other advantage of a wide grip is that the bar won't have to be lifted as high. Watch the bar now as it goes over my head. Notice that it just barely clears the top of my head. So I have to lift the bar, in this case, only just above the top of my head in order to snatch it. So that can be an advantage. However, if the grip is so wide, then when I reach down to take the bar from the floor, I'm going to have to bend my leg at a considerable distance and then fold with the back a considerable distance to take the bar from the floor. If I had a narrow grip, 
that ball would be much easier to take from the floor. I'd be able to raise my hips a little bit higher, my legs would be in a stronger position, my back would be in a stronger position, so that would be an easier thing for me. Also, with a narrow grip, most lifters find that their gripping power is greater than when the grip is all the way out to the sides. Another advantage of the very wide grip is that it takes less shoulder flexibility to hold the bar overhead. You can move the bar forward and back more easily with a wide grip. You'll find that a little harder to do with a narrow grip. However, the wide grip puts a little more stress on the shoulder muscles and on the elbow joints than the narrow grip. So these are all trade-offs that the lifter has to make. Now, there's often guidance given about selecting a grip in the snatch where someone will say, put your arms out to the side, measure the distance between the elbows. Or alternatively, put one arm down the side, the other to the other side with the fist extended and measure the distance from the shoulder to the end of the fist. I don't like either of those approaches because they take into account shoulder width and arm length, but they don't take into account torso length, leg length, and a series of other things. So I use a much simpler method. I simply say to an athlete, let's hold a bar at a fully extended level. Now this position for me is about ideal. The bar is right at the top of my thighs. When I bend forward here, the bar is lying right across the top of my thighs. If I had a wider grip, it would be at my hip bones. Typically when you have a bar at this level, you will pull and bang it with the hips, you'll hurt your hip bones, and you'll tend not to have the ability to pull the bar as straight as you would if the bar is in a more correct position toward the top of the thigh. You'll get less leg drive. You'll actually miss your legs altogether during a good part of the pull. You'll end up high over here and not be able to generate as much power with that kind of a grip. If you bring the grip in here to the point now, in my case, when my bar is now resting about a third down my thighs, I will also not be able to get quite as much leg drive or as long a pull in this kind of a position. So for me, this works out about right. And so I saw most lifters with a grip that places the bar <coughs> exactly at the top of their thighs, and then we vary it over time. But this is a very good method, very simple. It doesn't require you to measure anything. You simply hold the bar, take note of uh, various positions, and when you feel it's the right spot, start there. If anything, I on the side of a little narrow grip at the start. You can always move it out over time. Don't change the grip very much at any one point in time because that can put a big stress on the shoulders if you're not used to it. Any change in lifting technique should be done very gradually. But the lifter will refine a grip over time and you'll find that it's just perfect for you. In selecting a clean grip, a lifter faces many of the same issues as in the snatch. A wider grip will bring the bar up higher at the finish of the pull simply by standing up. But an hour of grip will be, make it easier for the lifter to take the bar off the floor because it will enable the lifter to bring the hips, start with the hips a little bit higher and with the back a little bit straighter than he or she would if the grip was wider. They had to bend over further to reach the bar from the floor. In the clean is also the added factor of the elbow whip. Most lifters will find that with an hour of grip, they find it much easier to snap the bar on the shoulders <coughs> and to get the bar, the elbows high when the bar is on the shoulders. With a wider grip, they'll tend to find it a little bit harder to get the elbows up. Now one trick of that is to not think of just simply pushing the elbows up when you have a wide grip, but to push them in as well. And pushing them in will enable you to get the bar a little bit higher. But nevertheless, most lifters do find it a little more difficult to raise the elbows when they do have a wider grip. I also find that lifters tend to pull backward a little bit or to straighten their torso a little bit earlier when they have a wider grip versus a narrower grip. And so for some lifters, they'll find excessive jump back and other kinds of uh, directional problems with a wide versus a narrow grip. Now remember, whatever grip you use, you can move it for the jerk. It's ideal if you don't have to because that's one less thing you have to worry about. But it is permissible once a lifter has done a clean to move the bar or move the grip outward or in any direction they wish and get secure for the jerk, which brings us to guidance for the jerk grip. Now in the jerk, the wider the grip, as in the snatch, lifter does not have to raise it as high. When my grip gets narrower, the bar is further above my head. However, with a narrow grip, most lifters will find they feel stronger, the shoulders feel stronger in that position. They're able to exert a little more muscular force against the bar than they are with a wider grip. So one may offset the other. You'll have to experiment 
with that. Also, flexibility is a consideration. With a wider grip as in the snatch, lifters are more flexible. They'll move the bar around more easily. They'll feel more comfortable with a wider grip. With a narrow grip, typically, they're going to have a little more trouble moving the bar behind them and just controlling them in general. So these are the trade-offs that one has in clean and a jerk grip. Another trade-off that lifters have to consider is the width of the feet in the pull and in the thrust for the jerk. Now, most coaches advise a hip width stance, and I agree that generally that's the most favorable stance. It's a position very similar to a jump, and lifters are able to generate very good and explosive leg power with that kind of a stance. However, many athletes do find that a somewhat different stance is appropriate. For a lifter who has difficulty in getting the back arched and taking the bar off the floor, lifters in the narrow stance may find that it's difficult to get an arch in the lower back. They move their stance out, and they find that they can get that position more easily with a wider foot position. Similarly, in the jerk, some lifters find that with a wide stance, they're able to be more upright in the jerk. Lifters, again, who have some flexibility difficulties and find that when they dip with a narrow stance, they tend to dip a little bit forward, they widen the stance out, turn the toes out a little bit, and they can dip much more upright. So <clears throat> you will sacrifice a little bit of leg drive with a wider stance, but it may help in a situation where a lifter is having some difficulty with flexibility. So there again, it's something to trade off a little bit, to play around with, to experiment, and over time you'll find a stance that works best for you. We cannot leave the subject of foot stance without touching on the frog style, a style which was used by a number of world record holders during the 1960s and has fallen out of favor today despite its merits. In this style, the heels are, heels are placed together, or nearly so. The toes are turned out at anywhere from 45 to 120 degree angle, and the knees are wide apart. The torso is generally more upright than in the normal pull, so there is less stress in the back. There is also a less complicated knee movement back and forth than in the conventional style as the st pull proceeds. The trade-off is a smaller base of support in the feet due to the position of the feet. We invited Karn Marshall, who was a five-time gold medalist at the World Championships, nine-time national champion, the uh, first women's world champion from the United States. And in lifting in the inaugural women's world championship, she lifted the heaviest weights of anyone in any weight class, although she wasn't in the heaviest uh, weight class. And um, has had uh, uh, many world records in weightlifting as well. She's going to demonstrate the finer points of the jerk. And uh, we're going to start by just asking her to take it from the rack. And we're going to show some of the things to think about when the lifter is taking it off the rack. Now the starting position, the bar is well up on the shoulders. It's supported by the shoulders, not the hands. When she dips for the jerk, as she's going to do, she's going to keep those elbows fixed or raise them slightly when she dips, but she's never going to let them drop. She's never going to let the elbows down. So do, if you'll do one rep for us, Karin. Okay. Now notice when she dipped her body, the torso was absolutely vertical and rigid. She's keeping a tight, rigid position. And when she prepares to dip uh, her body, she keeps her weight well back on her heels. She's not leaning forward and allowing herself to go forward like that and lose her balance when she dips, if you just want to bend. Some people have a habit, when they bend, of shifting forward like that, bending forward, losing their balance. If you just sit back on your heels when you start, you're going to go straight up and down. It needs to be a piston-like action, uh, just ver totally vertical, no horizontal component, whatever. Lifters generally lower the bar from 8 to 12 percent of their heights when they bend the legs in preparation for the jerk. Some lifters bend the knees only a small amount after the explosion phase of the jerk. This permits the lifter to stop the downward motion of the bar easily and abruptly because of the strong leg position. This abrupt switch from the dip to the upward drive facilitates the generation of bar bend at the bottom of the dip, which then causes the barbell to spring upwards. A longer dip enables the lifter to bring the leg muscles into play more forcefully and for a longer period of time than a short dip, but it is harder to stop the downward motion of the bar abruptly, so some bar spring is lost. Quick dips like this one generate maximal bar spring and elicit a stretch reflex from the legs, but can make bar control difficult. A 
slower dip is more easily controlled and ensures that the ball will remain in contact with the shoulders during the dip. Both slow and fast dips should be reversed rapidly for the explosion. The issue of the body's extension is at least as crucial in the jerk as it is in the snatch or clean. The lifter should barely straighten the legs and rise on the toes little or not at all. As this lifter illustrates, Foot movement to the split should begin as the bar is leaving the shoulders. Most mischarics arise out of a failure to move under the bar early enough or fast enough. This lifter extends too long in the jerk and she wastes valuable time that could be used in moving under the bar. Some of the highest power outputs ever recorded by human beings occur during the explosion phase of the jerk. so it must be done explosively. But extending the legs for too long a period is a major mistake in the jerk. As is the case in the snatch and the clean, it is critical to move rapidly under the jerk. Look how quickly and smoothly this lifter does it. In contrast, here is a lifter who moves more slowly and less efficiently. She may lift a lot, but she'd lift a lot more if she moved faster. The last aspect for the jerk to really be concerned about is the overhead strength, the ability to support the weight overhead. And there are some tips to making sure that you have that overhead strength. One is, of course, to develop the arms and shoulders with pressing exercises and develop sufficient strength so that you're comfortable with the weight overhead. But there are some things technically that one can do to facilitate the lockout. Now, Karn will uh, do a jerk and hold the position, and I'll point out some of these uh, areas. Okay, note that the elbows are fully locked. They're turned, the weight is to the rear of her head. Okay, the shoulder blades are being pulled together. These are all the keys to keeping the bar solidly locked overhead. Now she recovers front foot first, and then back leg, and she's prepared to re-rack the bar. Many lifters adopt improper elbow positioning with the weight overhead in the snatch of the jerk. Some position the outside of the elbow pointing to the side or forward. This is a relatively weak position. Instead, we want to position the elbow so that the outside of the elbow is pointing to the side and rear. This generally lessens the stress on the triceps and elbows. Turning the elbows properly is facilitated by pulling the shoulder blades together and relaxing the shoulder muscles somewhat. This kind of elbow positioning is particularly important for the lifter who cannot straighten the elbows fully with the arms overhead. When the lifter assumes a split position, it's important that the front foot be flat on the floor, the back foot is up on the toes, and the lifter is slightly pigeon-toed, which is to say that the heel is outside the toe on the back leg, the heel is slightly outside the toe on the front leg. This gives the lifter a great deal of control forward and back in the split. If you allow your front foot to turn outward this way, very poor stability on the knee, very little ability to hold the balance. Similarly in the back leg, if you let your foot turn like this, all the weight goes on your big toe. There's a lot of stress on the groin rather than the front of the thigh, and tremendous instability back and forth. First, we will illustrate a deep split. Notice that with such a style, the bar needn't even reach the top of the lifter's head as a result of the drive. This is a very efficient style. The major drawbacks are that it requires flexibility and practice to learn, and some lifters find it difficult to develop the skill to recover from such a position. But that skill will come with practice. This lifter uses a more typical split depth. Such a position is easier to learn than the deeper one. It also requires less time for the lifter to reach this position than a deeper one, offsetting the advantage of the deeper split somewhat. This lifter has the shortest split I've ever seen. There is nearly no split at all, and the back leg is nearly as bent as the front one. Most lifters have at least some bend in their back legs in the split, but some use a straight rear leg style. Some lifters use what is known as the power jerk style. These lifters do not split at all, but rather generally jump their feet outward a little and squat down partially. This style looks very impressive, but most power jerkers throw the bar about as high as split jerkers do. The power jerk is less stable than the split jerk, so few lifters use it in competition. A very small number of lifters use the squat style of the jerk. This lifter does it very ably. 
The squat jerk requires tremendous flexibility in the lower body and the shoulders. For most lifters, it is even more unreliable than the power jerk, which is why very few lifters use it. Note that this lifter and other squat stylists drive the bar as high as splitters do and then sit down. So even the efficiency of this technique is questionable. As the lifter prepares for the jerk, they typically have the head back, the chin tucked in, so the head is slightly behind the torso, and then the bar is lifted overhead from that position. Now, one last point about head position is the relationship of the bar to the head. Most athletes will carry the bar just at the rear of the head when it's overhead. So in the snatch or the clean, the bar is positioned right at this point in relation to the head. Here we use a throw and catching a heavy barbell low while balancing on a relatively small surface of their feet. So balance is very critical and one of the ways to maintain balance is to find a focal point. That is a point where the lifter tries to focus continually throughout the lift. Now generally during the explosion phase the lifter will lose sight of such a spot but the idea is to regain the spot visually as quickly as possible after the explosion phase. So if I were doing a jerk I would set up in this fashion. My focal point would be just above eye level which would be true in the snatch and the clean as well. And then as I do the jerk I might lose the focal point during the explosion phase but as soon as I landed in the split my eyes would travel back to that spot and that would help give me my spatial orientation and help me maintain my balance throughout the lift, so it's important to have a focal point while one is lifting. The lifter must start with the bar horizontally in front of the legs with an overhand grip, palms down, the grip that we've used throughout most of this uh, video. Any lift to the knee height is considered an attempt. If the lift goes that high, that is considered an attempt, that high or any higher. However, if the lifter lifts the bar from the floor an inch or two, and then place it back on the floor, they can start again as long as there's time on the clock and complete the lift. So that's the latitude there, but once it reaches the height of the knee, that's it. Then when the lift is actually done, it must be a single move from the floor to the shoulders or overhead. No pause in the execution of the lift. A pause like that would be illegal. The athlete has to pull it smoothly as he'll do now to show you the proper way to do it, no hesitation, uh, straight, continuous pull. So, in <clears throat> overhead, when the bar is being locked out, it locks right out to arm's length. It has to go right to a full lock position where the snatching or jerking. You cannot push it up to a certain height and then press it out with the arms. Once you get it overhead, you cannot rebend the arms and then lock it out again. It must stay in the locked position firmly until you're told to put the bar down. You can rotate the shoulders, you can move the bar back and forth, but you cannot bend the elbows and then straighten them out again. If for some reason you can't lock your arms, then you need to tell the referees before you do your lift and point that out, point out the anatomical difficulty that you have, and the referees will adjust their judgment accordingly. So that's important to do. When the lifter is cleaning the bar to the chest, it must be on the chest above the nipples. And you must put the bar on the shoulders. You cannot put the bar on the shoulders before uh, turning the elbows. So you can't hold the bar up to the chest, with the elbows still up, and then turn them around. You have to turn the elbows uh, first. That would not be an acceptable uh, kind of a lift. Now, if you do rack the bar low on the chest, as long as you keep it there, you can jerk from that position. You cannot raise the bar from the position where it contacts the chest. However, if you clean the bar and you rack the bar in a position well above the shoulders and you're uncomfortable because the bar is too high, then you're always allowed to lower the bar from the position that it assumes. You can lower the bar back to the chest. You can also move the hands in or out after the clean. They're not permitted to touch the elbows to the knee or to the leg in the squat position. The, el the <coughs> uh, elbow must be well clear of the knee or the thigh. Don't even allow them to go close. You're allowed to grip the bar anywhere up to and including the inside collars of the bar, 
but you cannot grab the collars themselves, not that you'd want to, but it's permitted to do that. <clears throat> the bar can touch anywhere along the legs. It can touch the shins, it can touch the knees, it can touch the thighs, it can touch the lap, the, the stomach. You can unhook your grip at any time during the lift. This occurs most often after the clean and before the jerk. Now after the clean and before the jerk, you can't bend the knees. And then decide, oh, I'll, I think I'll do it again. You've got to do the attempt and go after it, and that's it. But if you dip one time and pause and rethink what you're doing, that will not be permissible. Now when the lifter is lifting, they're not permitted to oscillate the bar. When the lifter cleans the weight, with a very heavy weight, particularly it'd be hard to see here, but the plates can cause the bar to spring back and forth. The lifter can't stand there moving the bar and hope they can get the bar overhead and move it around. Uh, they have to wait until the bar is motionless and not oscillate it. And nothing except the feet are allowed to touch the floor. If the lifter does, let's say, a split position and the knee touches the floor, That would be an illegal lift. If the bar or the body are not in line with the feet, that would be considered no lift. So that type of lift would not be good. The lifter must now straighten the body, bring everything in line. And then when the bar is motionless, they're given a signal to replace the bar to the platform. Now that we've covered the subject of weightlifting technique on the competitive or classic lifts, we're ready to address the issue of the kinds of exercises other than the competitive lifts themselves that can be used to improve performance in weightlifting. Many of these exercises are used by non-competitive weightlifters as a foundation of their training. So those of you who do not plan to compete in weightlifting will find the discussion of these exercises to be of value as well. Lifters often separate the clean and the jerk in training so that they can focus on one element of the clean and jerk at a time. And this can be a very effective training method. Here we have Konstantin Starakovich, 1996 Olympian for the USA, demonstrating the clean. While lifters do practice cleans and jerks separately, most do at least some clean and jerks together in their training. As a competition approaches, the frequency of doing clean and jerks together generally increases. If one practices the clean a great deal by itself, it is a good idea to prepare mentally to do the jerk at the end of each clean. In this way, a lifter will be more prepared to do clean jerks later on. The jerk is practiced separately from the clean by taking the bar from a rack. This is a supportive device, generally referred to as a squat rack, because that is its primary use. More about that later. Lifters who have trouble jerking what they clean will find practicing the jerk separately particularly helpful. Lifters vary greatly in their ability to jerk from the rack, with some struggling to do as much from the rack as they can after a clean, while others can do 10% more from the rack or even more. On the power snatch, the athlete wants to pull the bar in the same way they would for a squat lift, the correct mechanical pulling style, which you've seen earlier in the video. Uh, they want to catch the bar in a position so that the bar is overhead and they're in this type of position or higher. You don't want to be much lower than this. This is a position that you want to catch the bar in. Now, there are athletes who make the mistake of pulling the bar up and catching it backward like that. Uh, that's a stress on the back. It's not the position you want to catch the bar in. It usually comes from swinging or using the back to try to raise the bar instead of using the back and the legs together to raise the bar. And so that's the uh, technique that you want to make sure you're using when you're doing uh, the power snatch. You're going to catch the bar in this position. The torso is either vertical or slightly leaning forward as Karin will demonstrate. That was the tilt of the torso, slightly forward. Never, never backward. Now another problem that athletes run into is a little press out in the power snatch, where they pull the bar overhead, and instead of getting it to straight lockout, they have to 
uh, push it out at the end of the lift, the arm, it's core slightly bent arms, sometimes extremely bent arms, and then of course to press out. That's a mistake when you're doing a power snatch, you either lower the body low enough to snap the bar to arm's length, or the weight's too heavy and you go to a lighter weight. There is no point in pressing out, it's not a benefit of the exercise, it's a mistake, it puts you at risk for injury, it's not something you should be doing. You want to pull the bar, snap it out exactly overhead, and never have this kind of emotion going on in the uh, power snatch. Another mistake that's commonly made is <clears throat> improper foot movement. The lifter wants to land in the power snatch in the exact same position as they do when they do the squat lift. They don't want to jump the feet wider or narrower, but some people, in an effort to do a heavy power snatch, will pull the bar and jump into a wide uh, foot stance. <clears throat> this is a way of handling a little more weight, but it's incorrect. Karin went wider than she normally would on that just to demonstrate that uh, position. The lifter might also go too narrow. That's less common, but it happens occasionally. But what you want is to land with the feet in exactly the same position as when you do a squat lift. So that if you are caught in a point where you cannot stop the bar in this high position, you just ride it down into a full squat. A missed power snatch should be a full squat snatch. It should never be a total miss. So the feet need to be prepared for that eventuality. That's the practice that you need to do to make sure that it's uh, correct. Now the definition of a power snatch would be not lower than above parallel position. Karn will power snatch and just lower herself to the position that we would consider the lowest uh, acceptable for a power snatch. <clears throat> And that is with all parts of the leg above parallel. The lowest part of the thigh would need to be above parallel. We like to get it as high as we can. Okay, but that would be considered a little low for a power snatch. That would be just about borderline. And another inch up, that would be a power snatch. So that is what the lifter is shooting for, no lower than that position, and if possible, higher than that position. The muscle snatch is differentiated from the power snatch by the fact that the lifter does not bend the legs at all to catch the ball, but rather presses up with the arms to finish the lift. I don't like this relatively unpopular exercise because the pressing motion at the end of the lift doesn't resemble the timing of a snatch. Lifters handle 80 to 90 percent of their snatch in the power snatch and less in the muscle snatch. The power clean is one of the fundamental training exercises of many weightlifters and other power athletes. It, like the power snatch, is a very effective exercise for improving performance in the competitive lifts, but many athletes do them improperly. The bar should be lifted smoothly from the floor with the correct body positioning I explained earlier. Then the lifter should explosively straighten the body and catch the bar cleanly on the shoulders. Now let's look at some of the common errors that occur when lifters learn to do the power clean. You see how to perform the power clean correctly. Now I want to show you a few of the very common errors that people make because so many athletes train on the power clean and a lot of the Olympic lifters, but simply want to learn how to do that exercise to improve their explosive power. Now, the first thing is the power clean, you use your legs, your hips, and your lower back together. A lot of lifters make the mistake of simply swinging the ball to the shoulders or using almost a reverse curl kind of a movement like this. And it's really the back that's ripping back and forth or moving back and forth and causing the ball to rise up. The legs, the hips, and the back have to be used in conjunction in a jumping almost kind of a motion without coming off the ground to launch the bar and the bar is kept close to the body. At no time does it swing away from the body. There's not any kind of reverse curl exercise. It's, it stays close to the body. Okay? Also, when receiving the bar, do not lean too far forward. A slight lean forward is okay. Vertical is fine. Absolutely never lean back. Big stress in the lower back. Big mistake. Don't rack the bar low on the shoulders. Try to get it down here to cheat, to do a little bit more. Make sure the bar is always way up on top of the shoulders and the elbows are up. Okay, that's the correct way to receive a bar in the power clean. Now, the amount of leg bend is the same as we showed earlier for the power snatch. You want the lower part of your legs above parallel, but you use your legs to absorb the force of the bar when it comes down. You're not using your back to do it, you're not using your arms to do it. You're bending your legs to catch the bar that's the variable with a lower, with a heavier weight, a straighter, with a um, lighter weight. 
but that's what you're moving up and down. That's the only thing that's really absorbing the shock when you're doing the catch in the power clean. The torso, as I said, is vertical on the pull and the catch. So when I'm pulling the bar, at the end of the pull, my torso is like this. I'm now leaning back away from the bar. I'm now leaning back in this position to finish my pull. What I want to do is do everything straight in that kind of a fashion. And that's how I perform the power clean. I don't want my feet too wide, just as we said in the power snatch. You want your feet in the same position in which you squat. So that if you have to go down, you ride it down to a full squat. You don't jump wide. Wide is very stressful in the hips. It's not only poor technique from the lifter standpoint, but even those of you who never want to do a squat clean, very stressful on the hips. You can hurt your knees. All kinds of problems can come out of too wide of a stance. Now make sure that you stop pulling early enough to give yourself time to catch the bar. Don't make the mistake, as we showed in the technique part of this video, where you're trying to get the bar higher, so you're pulling with your arms, you're too far up in the toes, you lean back and you'll have no time to catch the bar on the shoulders, you'll try to go under it and it'll crash down on you, you won't be able to catch the bar. Finish the lift and give yourself time to get underneath. That timing element is very, very important in giving yourself the ability to catch the bar in the proper position. is performed in the same way as the jerk, but instead of splitting the legs, the lifter simply pushes up with the arms to complete the lift. The push press can build leg power and pressing strength, but the lifter must guard against the tendency to lean back at the finish of the lift, as this is often a problem with the push press. Some split jerkers use the power jerk to improve their jerking power. It offers a nice variation for jerk training. For many reasons, it's not as important as the power snatch or power clean. Lifters sometimes practice their lifts with a pause at some point in the pull. The most common place to pause is at the knees. Pausing is generally inadvisable as it interrupts the critical rhythm of the pull. But it can be useful to retrain a lifter who tears the bar off the floor at the start of the pull or assumes an improper position at the start or shortly thereafter. Some lifters like to do halting lifts occasionally just for variety in their training, and this is fine as long as they don't permit themselves to get into poor positions at the halting points. Snatches and cleans, both in the competition and power styles, are sometimes performed from the hang. When using this method, up with a bar, then lowers it to the desired position here above the knee and performs a lift. Above the knee is perhaps the most common hang position. Another variation of the hang lift is from the hang below the knees. Here it is particularly important for the shoulders to be in the same position relative to the bar as they are during the conventional lift. For most lifters, this means well forward of the bar. And positioning the shoulders above or behind the bar in this exercise can actually be detrimental to technique. The dead ring snatch, or snatch from a standing position, is an exercise whose purpose it is to teach the lifter to move rapidly under the bar. The lifter starts by standing fully erect with the arms hanging straight. The lifter then explosively contracts the trapezius muscles and jumps onto the bar with all possible speed. Very light weights are used at first. This exercise is very helpful for beginners and for more experienced lifters who need to focus on moving into the bar with greater speed. However, it, like other hang type exercises, should not be overdone. Lifters who already know how to squat snatch sometimes use this exercise as a warm-up for their squat snatches by doing a few light sets first. The dead hang clean is done in the same way and for the same reasons as the dead hang snatch. I found it to be more effective for the clean. Here again the lifter merely shrugs and explodes under the bar, emphasizing whipping the elbows quickly and very high. Ideally the upper arm should be parallel to the ground when the bar is caught on the shoulders. While most lifters practice this exercise with weights much lighter than their cleans, the great David Shepard cleaned 350 pounds in this exercise when he was cleaning just over 400 pounds using the conventional style. The snatch balance exercise is another exercise that is used to improve speed and positioning of the snatch. It can be done with and without a leg drive prior to the lifters exploding under the bar. I prefer the latter variation. Obviously, in the case of beginners, practice of this exercise is begun by using a stick or a light bar, and progression to heavy weights is made very gradually, 
neither sacrificing speed or technique. The drop jerk is used to improve speed and positioning in the jerk. It can be done with a slight preliminary drive as this lifter is doing or with none at all. While most lifters can and should practice this exercise with light weights, Dave Shepard did 350 pounds when his best jerk in the regular style was 430 pounds. Jerks from behind the neck can help the lifter who's having trouble positioning the bar at the rear of the head in the jerk achieve that position. They will not generally help a lifter who is driving the bar forward in the jerk. I do not suggest that one lowers the bar behind the neck in this or any other exercise as a mistake can yield a nasty bone bruise or worse. Use a spot or reduce singles and lower the bar in front of the body or drop it. Making sure that you follow the advice given in this tape or given by your coach about dropping the bar properly. Well, we're now going to show you an exercise that I call, for lack of a better term, the Drexler Jerk because I've never seen anyone else do it. But uh, it's an exercise I came up with to help me learn to split lower in the jerk. And I got the idea from a friend of mine who was training in a low basement and had to split very low when he jerked because he couldn't uh, stand all the way up and he would hit the uh, rafters overhead. So what I did is set up a power rack so that the, the bar is supported in a position lower than the lowest point in your dip. The upper part of the rack has sticks uh, uh, put in the rack in the position of pins, and you could use a rubber rod, it would be fine. Um, <clears throat> Alex Kolar, one of my lifters, came up with the concept of one with a hinge on it in the middle. But the idea would be that you have something here to tell you the height of the uh, bar and the jerk, and you would put this in a position at the highest point uh, that you hit, or if you want to lower your position, if you want to lower a split lower, then slightly below that. And then you would perform jerks within the rack as you would normally, but this would give you feedback to tell you whether or not you were splitting too high, whether or not you were driving the bar too high. This is again to learn to go into a lower position. We've invited Mike Jakes, former Olympian and many-time national champion and American record holder, to demonstrate the high pull. High pulls are used to develop stages one through four of the pull. Now, there are many variations. We'll demonstrate four. The first involves merely replicating the first four stages of the, of the pull with moderate speed. This version has limited carryover value to the lifts because of the lack of speed that is employed in performing it. The next version is one in which the lifter tries to develop a lot of speed at the end of the pull, does an explosive phase, but doesn't allow the arms to bend uh, at the end. So just goes up to a finishing position and tries to keep the arms fairly straight. The weight is so light that uh, it's just that type of position. They're actually checking the ball with the arms, prevented from going, preventing it from going any higher than uh, that stretch position. Okay, so that's done with an explosiveness, with an emphasis to raise the bar up, but the arms are kept straight. And many of the coaches who encourage lifters to do that are fearful that if they allow the arms to bend, that the lifters will use the, bar, the arms inappropriately when they're doing high pulls. But there are a lot of coaches who do allow lifters to uh, permit the arms to bend. Now Mike is going to do a version now where he's going to allow the arms to bend. But the important thing is that he's not pulling with his arms here. He's just allowing them to relax, and he's allowing the bar to come up. So now that he's done his explosion, the bar is flying up at the rapid rate, and he's allowing that to happen. But he is not actively exerting force against the bar with his arms at this point. He's not pulling with his arms, which would be considered uh, a technical mistake if it was done. A final version of the high pull is done with a rebound of the knees. Most lifters who perform the exercise in this way allow the knees to rebend even more than this lifter. Rebending the knees simulates going under the ball somewhat and may prevent overextension, which is sometimes a problem for lifters when they do pulls. Pulls are sometimes performed with a halt for the same reasons that the lifts are. Such pulls can also strengthen the body at points where the pull is most difficult, such as at knee level. The jerk drive can improve one's first four stages of the jerk. But receiving the ball on the shoulders can be traumatizing. Therefore, they should only be done for singles letting the ball drop to the floor after each wrap, but with a special rack that catches the bar. 
springs are more limited version of the exercise, but can do a nice job of training the lifter to get the spring out of the legs and the bar. Lifters sometimes perform deadlifts, effectively slow pulls, to develop their leg and back strength for the pull. Care must be taken not to lose the arch in the back, or to use a style that does not replicate one style in the normal pull, such as allowing the hips to rise faster and more extensively than in the pull. Lifters can work up to as much as 120% of their best snatch or clean in this exercise, as compared with 90 to 110% in the high pull itself. More weight than that generally leads to a technique breakdown. Lifters perform both lifts and pulls from what are known as blocks. These exercises are similar to lifts performed from the hang. However, most lifters find it easier to assume positions similar to what they are actually using in the lifts when they lift from the hang versus blocks. In addition, a miss from the hang can simply be dropped on the platform while a miss from the blocks can result in a nasty rebound that can send the bar back at the lifter. Lifts from the blocks do permit the lifter to set up more carefully and perform repetitions more precisely. As when doing lifts from the hang, starting positions identical to what would be occurring at that point in the full lift are essential. Lifters occasionally perform lifts or pulls while standing on an elevated platform or block. This requires the lifter to go through a greater range of motion when lifting the bar than from the floor. Such lifting can develop greater strength at the start of the pull. These exercises, while hardly popular, can be very helpful for lifters who tend to rush the bar from the floor, as it is pretty difficult to do so from this position. Finally, we have a version of the pull from the blocks in which the lifter begins with the center of the bar supported on a single block. Such a position makes the start more difficult because the bar is already bent when the athlete lifts the bar from the blocks. When lifting from two blocks, some bar bent at the start helps the lifter to get the bar going. The good morning exercise is used to strengthen the pull. The lifter supports the bar on the rear of the shoulders and leans forward, either to a very deep position, as we were showing here initially, where the legs are almost straight and the lifter goes to a parallel position with the floor. Or alternatively, a much more popular version today is with legs partially bent and bending over only partially, so the lifter resembles the finish of the pull. Deadlifts with the legs straight or nearly so places more stress on the back, buttocks, and hamstrings than regular deadlifts. However, because the positions assumed do not resemble what is normally done while lifting, the carryover value is limited. On balance, I like all forms of deadlifting better than their counterpart good morning exercises because of better ability to control the bar while deadlifting. Jerk recoveries and supports in the power rack are intended to improve the lifter's ability to hold weights overhead in the jerk. They can be done in split or partial squat style. While most lifters think the benefit of these exercises arises out of the ability to handle heavy weights heavier than those in the jerk, my experience has been that using weights similar or even less than those used in the jerk are more beneficial because the lifter can assume correct positions and learn proper muscle tensions with lighter weights. For example, locking the elbows forcefully while relaxing the shoulders so that the elbows can turn properly, as was illustrated earlier. The overhead squat is used to build strength and balance in the squat snatch. One uses the same grip and foot position as in the squat snatch. This is a great exercise for beginners. The front squat builds the strength needed to come up from a clean. It is performed with the bar on the shoulders, elbows up, chest out, back arched, knees over toes, and balance shifted to the rear of the foot as one descends. The back squat, or squat, is one of the most fundamental exercises for weightlifters. It strengthens the start of the pull and the ability to stand up from the clean. Note that weightlifters squat all the way down as they are strengthening their low position in the clean and not trying to see how much they can squat. We've demonstrated how to do a squat correctly. Now we want to show some of the common mistakes that are made while performing the squat. The first is not keeping the back arched, the lower back arched, and the chest out. It's rounding the back. 
many lifters round either at the start or when they hit the bottom position, they let the lower back round out, upper back loses its position. This is a definite mistake while squatting. Another problem is tilting the torso forward too much while squatting. Many lifters begin with the torso forward and carry it that way throughout the lift, use the back too much, use the hips too much, and not enough of the legs. A squat is a leg exercise. You want to keep the torso upright. Other lifters begin with the torso in good position, squat down with it in good position, but then when they come up and reach a sticking point, they let the back lean forward. And this is putting more stress on the back and less on the legs. Another thing that lifters do is time squat improperly sometimes. The basic way to squat is to go down smoothly and come right back up, but without a bounce, just smoothly out of the bottom. Some lifters go down too slowly and come up too slowly. And other lifters just go into a free fall when they squat and bounce out of the bottom. Now, while there may be times when you want to squat more quickly or more slowly for a training effect, the normal method of squatting was the one originally shown. Some lifters position the bar either too low on the back, well down the shoulders. It takes pressure off the uh, legs somewhat when they squat. And you can squat more that way, but it's not the best position for training the legs. And other lifters let the ball roll up too high, so it's against the neck, putting unnecessary pressure on the neck. It should be on the trapezius muscles and on the top of the shoulders. That's the correct positioning of the ball. It's important when one does the squat to keep the knees over the toes so that the knees are operating in the manner of a hinge joint. Some lifters make the mistake of permitting the knees to travel inward when they squat, inside the toes, or to permit the knees to go outside the toes too much when they squat. And both of these are mistakes. The closer you can keep to knees over toes, the less stress and strain will be on the knees. Front and back quarter squats are sometimes used to strengthen a lifter's legs, but carry over from partial squats to the lifts is limited and partial squats can never replace full ones. Now we're going to address some exercises that are used on occasion by Olympic lifters but because they're not mainstays we're not going to spend a lot of time explaining or analyzing them. The lunges are done to strengthen the legs and improve the balance in the split. The bar can be placed on the front or the rear of the shoulders. They are normally done to a lower position than the lifter uses in the jerk, with the feet in the same position as in the split jerk, or a little bit uh, wider or spread apart even longer. The legs are generally alternated to strengthen both sides of the body. Another version of the lunge was used by the two-time Olympic champion from Poland, Waldemir Bashanowski. In performing this exercise, the lifter's feet are supported by boxes and the bar is held in the hands. This enables the lifter to reach a deep and consistent position with the legs. The step up is another exercise that can be used to strengthen the legs. The lifter steps up on a high box with the weight held on the rear of the shoulders. Step ups are less specific than squats or lunges, so they have a limited carryover value to the lifts. They were once touted as a replacement for the squat, but I do not believe that this will ever be the case. Hyperextensions isolate the spinal erector muscles, buttocks, and hamstrings. The lifter who is supported at the hips lowers the torso to a 90 degree angle with the floor and then raises the torso until it is parallel to the floor or slightly above. This position is often held briefly. Many athletes find this exercise helps them to maintain an arch in the lower back while squatting or pulling. The glute ham raise is a variation of the hyperextension that permits a fuller range of motion in the buttocks and hamstrings by bending the legs at the end of the lift. The stretching version of the stiff-legged deadlift is used by some lifters simply to stretch the muscles of the lower back following the workout. The bar is gripped with a wide grip to facilitate a full range of motion. It is lowered close to the body and very smoothly while holding the legs straight. There is no bouncing or extended pausing at the bottom, and the empty bar or very light weights are used. I must caution you that back experts would cringe at seeing this exercise, and no one who has or suspects they have any back problems should do it, but many lifters have found it to be very useful over the years. Various forms of pressing are used to strengthen the triceps and shoulders for the jerk and snatch. This version is called the military press. Not only the arms and shoulders lift the bar, the body is stationary. The bar is lifted close to the face. 
thighs, the bones press in the lower part of the chest, then slide arc back upward toward the top of the shoulders. The bench press is not very helpful to the overhead lifts, therefore it is not widely practiced by Olympic lifters. Bench pressing is probably the single most dangerous weight training exercise. Fatalities when the bar is dropped on the head or neck are not unknown, so spotter should always be used. The incline press falls between the military press and the bench press. It is more related to the overhead lifts than the bench press, but less so than the military press. It places less stress on the lower back than the military press, but most of us don't experience problems with strict military presses, so prefer doing them. The seated press is similar to the military press. Being seated precludes cheating with the body to get the weight up, but in my experience puts great stress on the lower back by restricting the upper body movement so much without anything to support the upper body, so I don't recommend them. The press behind the neck is similar to the military press, except that the bar begins behind the neck. Now the wide group versions can be done as they can for the military press. In my experience, more of this report shoulder pain from presses behind the neck than from military presses, so I prefer the latter. Whichever version you choose, pressing exercises are important to strengthen the shoulders for snatches and jerks, so I recommend that all lifters do them. Some lifters perform pressing from a squat position. It may help them develop balance and pressing strength specific to the squat snatch, but I don't like any exercise that requires a lifter to sit in a squat position for very long, and I find pressing from this position to be awkward. Dips strengthen the shoulders and arms, but they don't tie in well to overhead lifting, and I've seen too many shoulder injuries from them to allow my lifters to do them. Shrugs are sometimes performed to strengthen the trapezius muscles. They have limited carryover to lifting performance, but can be used by lifters with a lean or lower back problem to maintain pulling strength somewhat. A second version, called the power shrug, brings the back into play more, so it has a greater relationship to lifting performance. It's very similar to a hang high pull. The high shrug, named after the early American lifting star who invented it, can be used by an athlete who cannot hold the bar for some reason to develop the trapezius muscles. But it is certainly not a mainstream exercise for weightlifting training. The upright rule is used by bodybuilders for shoulder and trapezius development, but it can be very stressful on the shoulders and does not simulate lifting in any meaningful way. So I do not recommend it for weightlifters. The men on the row is used by some lifters to improve their ability to get the chest out and keep the shoulders back, not up, while lifting. It may have some value for this purpose, but this style of bent over row places great stress on the lower back. The long arm version of the bent over row is much safer for the back and much less subject to cheating than the standard version of the bent over row. A variation in which the elbow is held further out to the side than this lifter is showing is also popular. Pausing at the top and pulling the shoulder and blades together confers added benefits. Grip strength is a very important characteristic of a weightlifter. And a lot of lifters neglect training their grip. They do lifts and that's it. And for many lifters that is adequate. But for lifters who have problems with their grip, who have small hands as I do, they'll find that they have to do supplementary work to strengthen their grip. I found early in my career I had some gripping problems. I could snatch more with straps than without. And later when I worked my grip, I found there was virtually no difference using straps or not. You can start with a gripper like this. It has kind of an A-frame design. You just squeeze it shut. Uh, the problem is if you notice that at the bottom, my small fingers are spread wide at the top. My larger fingers are not spread as wide. So it's kind of an uneven uh, exercise in certain ways, at least in the context of a weightlifter where you're going to be gripping the bar with the hands uh, fairly closed. Now this, this gripper is known as a super gripper. Notice that here, there's not as much of a difference in the spread between the bottom and the uh, top of the gripper. You have springs which adjust. You can move the springs up and make it more difficult, move them down and make it easier. And you squeeze in this way, bring the handles together. Very sturdy kind of a device, not very expensive and very highly adjustable. I think overall your best kind of portable uh, gripping device. A plate loading gripper is also quite effective. 
but when using it, one has to guard against the tendency to rotate the hand, which can turn the exercise into a one-arm deadlift with bent fingers. Still another gripping exercise is the one-arm deadlift, where the lifter raises the bar off a rack, and because he's using only one hand, there's a lot of stress on the grip and very little on the body. However, the hand is not in the same position as in the snatch where the hands are spread and the wrist is at a different angle. So some of us also like to do a wide grip, non-hook uh, deadlift so that they work to strengthen the grip and just hold it on top for a few seconds with a non-hook grip and that will really strengthen the grip. Strong abdominal muscles help to support a lifter's back, so I recommend abdominal exercises for all lifters. There are many exercises that strengthen the abdominals. The traditional straight knee sit-up has fallen out of favor due to its alleged stress on the lower back and use of hip flexors while one is performing it. But both of these areas need to be prepared for heavy lifting. The bending version of the sit-up stresses the back less. Crunches are done by keeping the legs in a fixed position, typically with the knees up, and then just rolling the torso upward off the bench. This isolates the abdominal muscles more than any other exercise. The incline version of the sit-up and related exercises tends to stress the lower back less than the flat version and stresses the abdominal muscles more. So these variations are very beneficial for the weightlifter. Normal sit-ups will reduce the size of the waist, but when sit-ups and other abdominal exercises are done with resistance, they will build and strengthen the abdominal muscles. So I always recommend adding resistance gradually and keeping the reps to no more than 10, so that the lifter is actually developing strength in the abdominals, which is the objective of the exercise. Twisting versions of abdominal exercises tend to stress the oblique muscles on the sides of the waist, in addition to the abdominals, so they are very useful. Leg raises tend to stress the muscles of the lower abdominals and the hip flexors more than sit-ups and crunches. Some find these movements stressful in the lower back. If so, an incline version with the head raised may be helpful and at the same time puts more stress on the abdominal muscles. One, many athletes find that bent knee leg raises or frog kicks are more comfortable than the straight leg version, and they certainly permit one to crunch the lower abdominals to a greater degree. Incline versions of this are more advanced than hanging versions where you are hanging from a chinning bar or supported by dipping bars are more advanced still. The V-up is a two-for-one exercise, combining the leg raise and the crunch. This is a very effective exercise, but it takes some practice to get used to the coordination of the movement and the balance involved. It's one of the most advanced abdominal exercises and very Side bends isolate the oblique muscles. They are often foolishly done with weights held in both hands at the same time. When this is done, the weights counterbalance each other, so you might as well have no weights at all. Holding the weight in one hand works the oblique on the opposite side of the body, as is shown here. The side hopper extension is my favorite oblique exercise. Naturally, it needs to be done on both sides of the body. Resistance can be added after a time. Taking the practice on an incline bench or on the floor of the version shown proves to be too difficult at first. Curls have little direct value for lifters, as the arms do not pull the bar up and the cleaner the snatch. But some lifters experience elbow discomfort in the snatch or jerk. These lifters are usually those who have elbows that hyperextend or go past the point of being straight and actually bend backward when they are locked out. In such a case, curls can help to strengthen and stabilize the elbows. Curls should be done strictly with no body movement assisting and to the fullest extent of the arms up and down. Reverse curls attack the arms at a different angle than regular curls, so we find them to be an excellent adjunct to curls and strengthening the arms. Often the lifter will curl one way one day and a different way on another day. The curling exercise which may have the most direct effect on stabilizing the elbows for lifting may be the Zotman or hammer curl. This is because the hand is positioned in a way quite similar to that assumed when a bar is overhead.
Plyometrics or exercising by contracting a muscle eccentrically and then concentrically in rapid succession have gained popularity in recent years. Perhaps the most popular version of plyometrics is the depth jump, which we are illustrating here. It consists of jumping from a box on a, or a raised surface onto the floor and rebounding up immediately. There's normally a pad placed under the feet. Plyometrics are believed to increase one's ability to reactively contract muscles and one's power capabilities. Weightlifting is so plyometric that I think plyometrics for weightlifters in most cases is overkill. Some lifters perform jumps in hopes that jumping will increase their explosive power. One of the favorite exercises is to jump from the floor onto a box or a horse and employ squatting quickly at the end of the jump to kill two birds with one stone. I'd prefer dead hang cleans or snatches. Okay, there are several training methods that athletes can use to improve their flexibility. The first method is called ballistic stretching in which the athlete bounces into a stretch position. Now most People advise that this not be done because the bouncing kind of emotion could conceivably cause the athlete to pull a muscle or to strain a tendon or a ligament through the bouncing motion. The most popular type of stretching exercise or method of stretching and the one that's most often recommended is the static stretch in which the athlete stretches as far as they're able to go comfortably, holds that position for anywhere from 15 seconds to as long as a minute and just stretches gently the area they want to stretch. Considered a very safe way of doing stretching. Now another way to perform the stretching motion and one that's become very popular in recent years and seems to help an athlete improve their flexibility more rapidly than some of the other methods is called PNF for proprioceptive, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. And that method consists of someone assisting the person doing the exercise and actually the athlete stretches to a position then pushes back against the person who's assisting them to fatigue the muscles that are being stretched. And then, after about six seconds, relaxes, and they go a little bit further. Then they push back again, another few seconds, relax, and they'll go a little further. And you'll find that each time you do that exercise, you're able to go a little bit further, and normally it's done several times. And you'll at the end of that uh, movement, the athlete will be going further than they were uh, at the beginning. That, that backward push or the push against the resistance in the opposite direction fatigues the muscles and then enables them to relax further. The last method is called active isolated stretching. It's where the, a person is assisted by someone else and to take the same exercise, I would push P forward to a position, hold it for a couple of seconds, then let him come back and relax, and push forward again, hold it for another couple of seconds, let him come back, and each time strive for a little more uh, range of motion. This uh, is actually my personal favorite. I think that it brings together some of the best features of the different exercises. It's a little more involved, it's a little more active, it involves more motion than the static stretching. So I think it replicates some of the activities that athletes actually do when they're lifting weights or performing athletic uh, events. Uh, I find it to be in some ways less stressful than static, also because static can go on the uh, ligaments after a while if you hit a bad position and stretch the ligaments out. So I've found that some people actually find they're irritated doing uh, the static. The active isolated, you're only in the stretch position for a couple of seconds, you come back, and then you return again to that stretch position. So it can be very effective and a very reasonable way to do uh, the stretching motion. It should be noted that stretching, although a lot of people perform stretching before a workout, there is a lot of evidence to suggest now that you should be warmed up thoroughly before you begin stretching. Your body temperature should be elevated. You should not come into the gym and do the very first thing in the workout as a stretching routine. You should do that later. And if you want to improve your flexibility and really train your flexibility, it's probably ideal to do your flexibility training at the end of your workout when you're fully warmed up, and that's the time to really be intensive about the stretching. So uh, that's something that somebody should bear in mind as they're designing their stretching program, planning when they're going to do it. Another thing to consider is specificity of stretching. 
uh, you can get great at a certain position, practice a certain exercise that somebody else, so someone suggests that you do, and <clears throat> you end up in a situation where you get really good at that exercise, but it may not carry over to the area that you're really trying to improve in terms of flexibility. So it's useful to test a certain exercise by performing it a little bit, using it to stretch out in a certain way, and then see whether the actual application of that new flexibility that you've gotten is helping you in the motion you're training for. So for example, if we're saying, well, the theory of the exercise we just had Pete do, and he has to stretch the hamstring so that he can keep his back flatter when he's starting a lift off the floor. Well, if he's practiced that for a while and he notices it isn't helping his position off the floor, then it's not specific enough to what he needs to accomplish. He needs to come up with a different exercise. So it's important to test those out and see what you're carrying over. I've seen people do full splits and all kinds of fantastic uh, flexibility exercises, and yet they're not uh, loose in the areas they need to be loose in in order to do heavy lifting. At this point, we're ready to demonstrate some of the exercises that lifters use to stretch the body in the areas that are very related to weightlifting. One of those exercises is called dislocate. You take a stick, a broomstick, keeping the arm straight, you rotate the bar back and forth, forward to back, and then back again, so that you stretch out the shoulders. This is very good for warming the shoulders up and, and getting the shoulders ready to do uh, snatches in particular, because that's the kind of grip that athletes are using. If you want to make the exercise more difficult, you move the grip a little bit closer, and that makes it uh, a little more of a test on the shoulders. The important thing is keeping the arms locked. Some people do the exercise, bend the arms, and there's really not much benefit that comes out of uh, doing that. It's very important for a lifter to have adequate flexibility in the Achilles tendon, and one of the best exercises for developing such flexibility is stretching against an upright, like a rack. You put the toe as high on the upright as you possibly can, move the heel in as close as you can, and then simply bend the knee, flex the knee, and try to push the knee toward the support. And if you do this properly, you will feel it in the back, in this area, back of the um, ankle and the Achilles tendon area. You do the exercise in, in the same fashion as we've demonstrated before, whether it's static or it's an AI method. But the idea is if you're not getting enough stretch in the um, Achilles tendon, if you're not feeling it there, then you need to make sure the toe is high enough on the support. Some people try to do it down here, and they're not going to get a very good stretch. Get the toe way up there heel close as you can and bend the knee, push in toward the rack and you should feel a stretch in the Achilles tendon. Another exercise that lifters find very useful is the quad stretching exercise. Here the athlete grabs the foot or ankle with their hand and they pull up and back somewhat on the foot. That stretches the quad area and uh, it's very effective in helping athletes achieve better bottom positions, squat positions when they're lifting. Now we're going to demonstrate a very good exercise for improving the flexibility of the wrists and elbows that the lifter can comfortably rack the bar either in a power clean position or in the full low squat position. We place the bar on a rack. The uh, bar is supported by pins beneath it, and we put pins above it to resist the upward pressure of the bar that's going to occur during the exercise, or we can load the bar up with weights. It works either way. The lifter goes under the bar, full hand on the bar if possible, lifts the bar against the upper pins, and you push up on the lifter's elbows. And hold that position for several seconds, then down, and you can repeat. A variation of this exercise is the PNF method we talked about before, where the lifter is going to stretch and then push down against resistance so that he's going to put his elbows in a position, I'm going to push him up, now he's going to push down against my hands to tire his muscles so that they'll stretch more. Then he relaxes and we're able to get the elbows somewhat higher. Then he repeat and push down again several seconds to fatigue the muscles and then he's going to relax and we get him still higher. And you can repeat this several times and each time the elbows will go a little bit higher, you'll get to a slightly higher position. This is an excellent, very specific exercise to improve the racking flexibility. Now sometimes when you get an athlete as big and strong as Chris, he can push down so hard against your hands that it's hard to resist and it's hard to offer him the resistance he needs. So a variation of this that we use is doing it with the lifter in the full squat position. Now there are two advantages here. One is that you get the athlete into the full squat, which is the position they're going to be racking a heavy clean. And so it's even more specific. 
And the other advantage is it's a lot easier to hold the, against the lifter when the lifter pushes down against your hand. So if you have a very strong lifter, you can actually brace your thighs against your hands, and now he can push down on his uh, elbows as hard as he wants, and I'm going to be able to hold that position. It doesn't require as much strength when you're resisting with your thighs and your hands. And again, this exercise is extremely effective for racking the bar. I never work with a lifter who with consistent practice on this exercise, daily practice, uh, sometimes multiple times a day, couldn't improve the flexibility sufficiently to be able to rack the bar comfortably. But it can be an uncomfortable exercise in the beginning. You can experience discomfort in your wrists and your elbows, and you can feel a choking sensation as the bar goes against the throat. All of that will dissipate over time as you improve your flexibility and become accustomed to the exercise. So persist and you will learn to rack the bar in the clean. Obviously, in stretching, as in anything else, if you're doing the exercise and you find that you're uh, in pain the next day, you may have overdone it, you need to back off a little bit, do it a little less intensity, and uh, slowly work your way into the level of flexibility you require. Okay, another exercise is squatting against the wall. Here, the lifter squats down with the back arched and tries to get as deep as they can keeping the lower back uh, in good position, the chest out. The closer you are to the wall, the more difficult it will be to squat properly, and that will really stretch out the uh, hips and the uh, legs and enable you to hit a correct squat position. Another exercise a lot of athletes like is st stretching with a bar in a full squat position. So as you can see, Peter's sitting down there with a the bar sort of just above the knees and is uh, stretching the ankles in that position, kind of stretching the knees forward over the uh, toes, and that's another way in addition to the Achilles tendon stretching that we showed you before to help improve the bottom position and help you become more comfortable in that position. Flexibility sufficient to take the bar from the floor in good position is critical for the weightlifter. And for a lifter who has trouble doing that, I recommend a very simple exercise. You can take the bar from a rack, or if you're having trouble getting position, I mean, I wouldn't as much recommend this, but let's assume I couldn't get a good position and my back was rounded out. Once you take the bar from the floor, you stand at attention. Most lifters can have no trouble assuming a good position here. Now, maintaining that good back position, maintaining the arch and lower back, chest out, you're going to lower the bar down, keep lowering it till you get to a point where you may feel that you're going to lose your position. Stop there, reassume the good position, hold that position for a few seconds, come back up again, and then you can lower it back down, trying to go a little bit further and maintaining that good position while you do that. Eventually, with enough practice, you're going to be able to do that exercise all the way down to the floor. If you're having trouble even getting to the floor in a clean grip, then <clears throat> practice it that way until you get down to the position. Eventually, widen it to the snatch grip, learn to get down in that position. And if you want a real challenge, stand on a little surface or use even a wider grip than you normally would in the snatch, get to the point where you're comfortable in that position. At that point, you're going to not have any difficulty taking the bar off the floor both in a correct position and one that's fairly comfortable. You shouldn't be down at the bar struggling to assume the proper position with all kinds of tension and pressure on yourself. You should be able to go down to that position comfortably and the practice of this kind of exercise will help very much in that regard. It's a very specific kind of an exercise. <clears throat> at this point, we're going to demonstrate an exercise that's very good for stretching the low position in a squat. Lifters do a lot of exercises to improve their flexibility. Very often they're not specific enough. This one is very specific to accomplish that goal. Now the idea here is the bar is set in a power rack. The uh, bar is supported by a set of pins below and the pins above will offer resistance to the lifter. This exercise is going to be done in the uh, AI fashion that we mentioned earlier. The lifter is going to do several reps. Each one, he's going to go into the full squat position, push up against the bar to push himself down into his lower squatted position as he can possibly assume, and he's going to keep his chest out, back arch while he's doing that, and let the legs absorb the pressure. After a few seconds of the low squat, he'll stand up, fully straightening the legs, and then go right back down again and resume. And uh, we're only going to show a few reps, but typically you do this about 10 repetitions. And notice he's getting underneath the bar in the full squat position. He's using the bar to push down against uh, his legs in the low squat position. Then he stands up. 
and gets set again and goes right back into that position and will repeat for several seconds there. And again, this will be repeated uh, up to ten times during the exercise. The floor lifter can begin training on technique and learning to do the Olympic lifts. We have to be sure that they have adequate flexibility to start their practice. One of the positions it's important to be able to assume is lifting the bar from the floor. So if a lifter can assume a position with a wide grip like this, with the back arched and the chest out in pro correct position, then they're ready to start practicing from the floor. They're capable of doing that. If on the other hand, a lifter just can't get down to reach the bar, they're too inflexible. They try to get down there and their lower back is rounded out and they're just not able to grab the bar properly, then that lifter needs to practice stretching before they're able to begin practicing the actual lift itself. Similarly, if a lifter is going to try to do snatches, they need to be able to do an overhead squat before they can begin to learn the low position of the lift. So you'll see if a lifter coming in the gym is able to hit a correct low position. If you've got a lifter who cannot do that, or can't lock the arms properly, or just can't get the bar it's straight here, but they just can't get it behind them, then their flexibility is inadequate to begin practicing the snatch. There's no point in trying to do the lift when you can't hold it in a proper position. Another test that we use to see whether weightlifters, uh, fledgling weightlifters have adequate flexibility is whether they can rack the bar on the shoulders. Now Alex is here with the weight resting on his shoulders, the bar, his elbows are high enough to practice the lifts. If a lifter can't assume this position, they're not ready to do cleans. You can't have them come in and try to practice cleans when they cannot rack the bar. Now let's say, for example, Alex couldn't get the bar on his shoulders. The lowest he could get the bar was here. It was not in contact with his shoulders. He's not ready to start cleaning. If he was able to have it on his shoulders, but his elbows were down in order to do that, he couldn't get his elbows any higher than this, then he would not be ready to practice the lifts and he should be doing pulls and other exercises in the meantime while he's trying to strengthen uh, excuse me stretch his elbows so that's important we test the squat position of new lifters with a front squat to see if they can squat to a below parallel position with their feet flat torso vertical and lower back arched a back squat test can be used for lifters with poor elbow flexibility other lifters have great difficulty either squatting down all the way or keeping the torso vertical or keeping the back from rounding out That event will suggest that the lifter elevate the heels on anything ranging from a 2x4 to plates, like the one shown here. And that elevation of the heels normally straightens the lifter up enough so that they can keep their torso vertical, keep the lower back arched, and hit a correct position. Still another test that we use of flexibility is to have a lifter put the bar overhead. They can either press it or, or jerk it overhead. And if they can get the bar behind their head in that kind of a position, then they're ready to do some jerks. If on the other hand, the athlete finds that they're unable to put the ball behind them, out of stiffness it's forward, they struggle, they cannot get it back further, can't lock the arm properly, then that lifter is not ready to do jerks, and so they have to practice flexibility exercises for the shoulders before they can begin the practice of the jerk. So these are the tests that one has to put an athlete through before they can begin practicing. The Olympic lifts are fairly complex movements. Therefore, when they are taught, they are generally broken into simpler segments, which are ultimately built upon and strung together until the full movement is learned. Okay, now we're going to demonstrate the teaching sequence that the USAW uses in their club coaches course as a means for taking starting lifters and teaching them the skills they need to be Olympic style weightlifters. <clears throat> we invited uh, Danica Rue to uh, demonstrate the USAW teaching sequence. She is a five-time junior national champion uh, of the United States and last year placed sixth in the junior world championships. We expect her to do uh, even better this year. She's part of a uh, family of uh, weightlifters who are uh, virtually dominating the, uh, the sport at this point. Her mother is national masters champion. We'll be seeing her a little bit later. And her brother recently made the junior world team with Danica, became the first the brother and sister ever to make the junior world team for the United States. 
Before we get to Danica's demonstration, we want to show two exercises that the USAW uses to acquaint new lifters with the pulling motion. The first is referred to as the back management exercise, since the way you teach the lifter to keep the chest out, back arched and locked, when leaning forward to do the pull. The next exercise is jumping with the bar. While this can teach the explosion, it can also teach some lifters to go too much up on their toes and to jump high in the air, which is inappropriate. Once these movements are performed correctly, the lifter is taught the clean. In the USAW clean teaching sequence, they start with power clean from mid thigh. Okay. Then they move to power clean from mid knee level. Then to power clean from shin level, mid shins. And finally, to power clean from the floor. We are showing these exercises in rapid succession, but each must be mastered before the next is begun, a process which can take several weeks overall. While the lifter is learning to clean, he or she is strengthening the arms and shoulders with pressing exercises. The pressing sequence begins with the clean grip and over a period of weeks moves on to the snatch grip, which prepares the lifter for learning the snatch. While the cleaning and the pressing sequences are being performed, the lifter learns the squat, beginning with the front squat. Once the front squat has been learned, the lifter moves on to the back squat. Once the lifter is well along in the clean sequence, though not necessarily at its end, he or she begins to learn the snatch sequence. The snatch sequence begins with the power snatch from mid-thigh, a position with the bar slightly higher than what is shown here. It then moves on to the power snatch from knee level, and then to the power snatch from shin level. Finally, the lifter is ready to practice the full power snatch from the floor. While the lifter is mastering the power snatch, the low position of the snatch is being taught with the following sequence. The sequence begins with the overhead squat. The next movement in the sequence is a pressing snatch balance where she pushes with her arms and lowers her body into the snatch position. Okay. Now the third thing in the sequence, she puts her feet in the squat position. She drives the bar a little bit with her legs and jumps down into the squat position. Okay. That's a heave snatch balance. And finally, she puts her feet in the pulling position, the same position that she would use to raise the bar from the floor. Now she's going to jump the feet out and into the squat, doing the same heave, so that she ends up in the squat position. So she'll bend her legs, drop down. The jerk learning sequence is normally begun while the lifter is learning the clean and consists of six exercises. The push press balloon neck is the first exercise in the USAW jerk teaching sequence. The lift of the arms to draw over the legs, then push the bar to arm's length behind the head with the arms. Once the lifter has mastered the push press behind the neck, he or she moves on to practice the regular push press. After the lifter has mastered the push press, he or she moves on to practice the power jerk behind the neck. The regular power jerk is taught next. At this point, the lifter is taught the footwork of the split jerk. He or she practices jumping down to the split position with no weight, so the complete focus is on foot movement and then lifting the bar. Once this is learned, they teach the split jerk and ultimately the clean jerk together. Another teaching sequence that we're going to take a look at is the one that's been developed or recommended by Medvier of the Soviet Union and is widely practiced there. Using that approach, they begin by teaching the snatch, and they begin with the power snatch. They move to the squat snatch. Then they teach the jerk. Then they teach the power clean and the squat clean. So the sequence is different from the USAW where they begin with the clean and end with the snatch. And the argument that the Soviets make for starting with the snatch is that it's a more delicate movement and they think that ought to be perfected before you move on to the clean. Demonstrating the of snatch sequence, we have Susan McCloskey, national masters champion and record holder. The sequence begins with the power snatch from above the knee. Then they go below the knee and they teach that position, okay? And they have the lifters working on that. Now, they move from the 
power snatch from above the knee and the power snatch below the knee into a deadlift to the knee. So they practice uh, lifting the bar from the floor to knee, knee level, okay? And the principle here is that you've learned the top approach first, now you're learning from the floor to the knee, eventually you're gonna weave these two uh, lifts together or these two approaches together so that you're doing the snatch pull so she would do a uh, smooth the deadlift right into the rest of the lift so she's doing essentially the first four stages of the um, of the lift by doing that snatch pull and then once she's got the snatch pull mastered she moves on to the full power snatch from the floor okay and once she's learned the power snatch in a, in a full sense, she moves on to doing the power snatch and combining it with an overhead squat. So now she's continuing to practice the pull, essentially the first few stages of the pull. She has it overhead, and then she goes into a full squat position. And this is preparing her to be able to do the full squat snatch. Now once a lifter has become comfortable doing power snatch and overhead squat, they move into the last uh, piece of the sequence, which is the full squat snatch. So she'll now put, the, put it all together and do the uh, full squat snatch. Okay. So now we're going to have Susan demonstrate the clean sequence. Once the lifter has learned to do the snatch sequence, then we learn to do the clean, which is the same general approach. First, it's power clean from above the knee. Okay, then power clean from below the knee. Then it is deadlift from the floor to the knee. So the lifter is learning the first part of the lift when it starts off the floor. And then once the lifter has learned to do the lift from the floor into the deadlift position, they're moving into the full uh, pull from the floor. Okay. And now it's all put together into the power clean. Okay. Once the lifter has learned to do the power clean, they move on to the power clean with a front squat. And by now you would be able to guess what the next step in the sequence is, which is the full squat clean. Okay, now we're gonna give Susan a break here. And I'll talk a little bit about the jerk sequence that the Russians use in their uh, teaching. Um, they teach the jerk, by the way, in between the learning of the snatch and the clean. Now, that's not to say that the lifter might not be learning uh, the jerk during some portion of the training on the snatch, and, and then ultimately might not be learning some portion of the clean while they're learning the jerk. It's not a complete break uh, between these le learning experiences, but the idea is to give the lifter the snatch to focus on initially, then move to learning the jerk, and then ultimately work on learning the uh, clean and perfecting the clean. Now, in the jerk, the lifter learns the front squat, which you've already seen uh, demonstrated as the first exercise, because they want the lifter to be comfortable with the weight on the shoulders, bending the legs at various angles with the weight on the shoulders. And once the lifter has learned to do that, they progress into the power jerk and then the full split jerk. And you've already seen uh, demonstrated on this video the power jerk and the full split jerk, so we're not going to uh, go on and demonstrate uh, that again. Now. The um, clean is learned before the, uh, the way the sequences interlock is the clean is learned before the full squat snatch. So as the lifter is moving through the snatch sequence, then the lifter is learning to do the clean sequence. And before they're even finished with that, they're, they're learning to do the cleans. And then once the lifter has mastered the clean, the full squat clean, and the jerk, the clean and jerk is put together. Bulgarians use a very different approach from the others we've seen in the sequence th thus far. Uh, they teach lifters the full back squat first. They believe that the squat position is the fundamental position of weightlifting, and the way to learn that is to learn to do the full squat. They then move from the back squat to the front squat, 
And at the same time, they're teaching their lifters to do a clean pull, a full clean pull from the floor. So the concept that the Bulgarians use is teach the bottom position, teach the athlete to be comfortable in the full squat. At the same time, teach the full pulling motion. Don't break it into sequences, teaching them one uh, fell swoop. And then once the athlete has mastered the pulling motion, has learned to do high pulls very uh, correctly, and is comfortable in the squat position, they move immediately into the full squat clean. And they just, just teach the lifter to clean. And their theory is that if you've learned to pull and you've learned to front squat, then you shouldn't have a problem learning to do the full squat clean. And they find that to be a very natural progression. As far as the snatch goes, they teach the snatch pull in the same way they do the clean pull. And they teach the snatch, again, following the clean. Then they teach the overhead squat. And once they've got both the snatch pull and the overhead squat done, they teach the power snatch. And then finally teaching the athlete to gradually lower the body into the full squat position. So they, they emphasize timing, they emphasize proper motion, but they string all, lifts, all of the sequences together, and it's a very holistic kind of approach. Uh, the advantage is you don't have to go and string the pieces together. When you learn to do up from above the knee, then you move below the knee, then you move to the floor. Sometimes there are problems in the transition. It takes some time to adjust to that change. And with the Bulgarian approach, it may be a little tougher to learn that pull at first, but once you learn it, uh, you've learned the full pulling sequence, and you don't have to go ahead and try to string it together. I found that system to be very effective in teaching beginners, uh, most often more effective than most of the other approaches as far as, far as the snatch and clean goes. But uh, there is no one approach that's good for everybody. We'll now present an approach outlined in a book published by the IWF called Weightlifting Fitness for All Sports. This method was reportedly used in Romania. The lifter begins by learning the first stage of the pull, which really means just going up to the bar getting positioned as if they're going to lift it from the floor. It's what we referred to earlier in the six stage uh, learning sequence as the uh, just the starting position. He's getting himself positioned, set, get his back in position, his legs and so on. That's the first part. And they practice that for a while to get the lifter to learn and feel comfortable with that position. Then they move on to sort of a deadlift exercise. The lifter just lifts the bar up to about that kind of a, a position to learn how to remove the bar from the floor while maintaining the proper position, how to use the legs first and then the back, the proper sequence of the muscle groups in lifting the bar from the floor. So the lifter is getting comfortable with that motion. So you notice that in contrast to the Soviet and to the uh, approaches used by the USAW, this approach starts from the floor and then moves further along. Now the third step is for the athlete to learn the explosion phase where they're lifting from the explosive position above the knee and snapping. And they teach the lifter, the lifter stands on a force plate or another device to measure the forces they're exerting against the platform. And little by little, the lifter learns what the most efficient explosion position is, how to make an explosive movement, how to be efficient in that motion. And once the lifter has learned that explosion phase, they move on to learning to pull below the knee. They learn to do that pulling motion. After the lifter does the pull from below the knee, he or she moves on to the power snatch from below the knee, then on to the full power snatch, an overhead squat, a drop snatch, and then the full squat snatch. There's a similar progression in the clean. Now in the jerk, they start by practicing stage one or the stage that leads up to the actual dipping of the legs in the jerk. They learn the proper position of the elbows or the torso, proper tensions and balance. Once they've done that, they begin to practice stages one through four or the first stage through the explosion phase. So it's a kind of jerk drive exercise which you saw earlier in the assistance exercise segment. Then we move on to a power jerk. They practice splitting without a weight to get their footwork uh, down. And then they move on to the split jerk. At this point, we've shown you several approaches to teaching and learning weightlifting technique. And all of those approaches will work. They've all been used to success in various countries and gyms around the world. But I, well, I believe that some methods uh, are preferable to others. I happen to prefer the Bulgarian approach myself. Uh, I feel that it's important to adjust the teaching method and the learning method for the lifter. 
If I have a lifter who comes in the gym and can't take the bar from the floor because of inadequate flexibility, well, then I can't teach him to do the pull from the floor as the Bulgarians suggest. I need to start that lifter with a pull in a partial position. And if the lifter has trouble with that, well, that same lifter might be able to learn to jerk first. So even though that might not be the ideal teaching sequence, I want the lifter to be able to do something and to experience some success from the first day, if at all possible. And so I'm going to look for a movement they can do appropriately that their flexibility does permit them to use, and then I go ahead and work on that movement. When you're teaching a new lifter technique, the key sequence to follow is to model that technique, in some cases to guide the lifter through the technique, for example with a hand on the lower back and the shoulders to teach positioning of the shoulders over the bar, and then to give the lifter feedback. And feedback is very helpful when it's given both on the nature of the error and the magnitude of the error. The bar is forward by an inch rather than the bar is forward. When you repeat that cycle over and over, modeling or demonstrating, in some occasions guiding, but, guiding, but <clears throat> often that's not necessary, and then providing feedback once the lifter has tried it, that will guide the lifter toward proper technique as quickly as it's humanly possible to do so. In weightlifting, there are five basic kinds of technical mistakes. There is positioning, effort, tension, timing, and balance. And balance is really a derivative of poor positioning, so it's not a fundamental error. Errors in positioning are you know, things like assuming a poor posture. We've demonstrated good posture throughout this video. Uh, taking it off the floor, for example, with the back rounded or that sort of thing. Uh, the other major error would be positioning in relation to the bar not having the bar toward the rear of the head when it's overhead, or when one is pulling, when it hits the position where the bar is at the knees, the shoulders should be well forward of the bar, and that could be an error in positioning. Errors in positioning cause many other errors. Errors in effort would be things like failing to give tremendous effort during the explosion phase of the pull, or when coming out of a heavy squat clean. Tension errors would be errors in either tensing muscles that don't need to be tense, for example, the arms, which would cause arm bend, or failing to have tension in areas where one needs it, for example, the lower back, which has to be tight and rigid throughout the lift. Errors in timing primarily occur in the explosion phase, where we've demonstrated before in this video, a lifter stays too long in the exploded position, doesn't move under the bar quickly enough, doesn't have a rapid transition, that would be an error in <coughs> timing. In order to correct errors, you should follow a logical sequence. First correcting errors, then danger of to safety, failure to lock the arms, failure to keep the elbows up and to clean. Then go for severity, the degree to which the error deviates from the model that you're teaching of technique. That tells you that you've got to work on that one next. And then also there's the sort of fundamentality or the idea that if an error precedes another error and causes that other error, then you better start with the error that came first. So the sequence is important, and those are the main rules to follow in deciding what to try to correct first. Another issue to be concerned about is when one is correcting errors, do not try to correct many at once. Stick to one thing, try to correct that, when you've got that squared away, then go on to the next one. Don't overload a lifter with telling them or her about many mistakes. They won't be able to retain it. They won't be able to apply whatever advice you're giving them. I've heard coaches say things like, pull the bar until it's at X height and then go underneath the bar. Well, if you pull the bar until you feel it at that height and then begin to move under it, there's going to be a delay anywhere from one to two tenths of a second. And the bar will be at a different point before you actually start to move under the bar. So you need to anticipate somewhat where you're going to be in the weightlifting movement in order to carry out those kinds of instructions. And the coach should be aware of that. Speed in going under the bar cannot be overemphasized, so when I describe the timing of the transition from the explosion to the squat under. I will often say to an athlete, the rhythm should be that fast between the feet hitting and the bar hitting the body. So there's, there's the balance of the bar against the body first, and then the feet hitting the floor. And that's the kind of a, uh, how quickly it moves from one to the other. That gives the athlete the sense of urgency to explode and then to move rapidly under the bar. The selection of appropriate weights and repetitions in learning weightlifting technique is very important. A lifter should begin with a stick or an empty bar to get the idea of the movement. Eventually, 
you add enough weight so the athlete can feel some resistance and feel the timing as the body moves with the bar. You want enough weight so that the bar simply doesn't fly around. Sometimes when an athlete is using a stick or a very light bar, they exert some effort and the bar flies away from the body. It goes up so easily there's no feel for what weight and what resistance is like. So you need to eventually add some weight to the bar. But it should be done very gradually and you should back up immediately if there's any indication that speed or fluidity of movement are being sacrificed. No one ever learns the proper technique of weightlifting with heavy weights. No one ever has, no one ever will. You must begin with light weights and progress gradually. And as a matter of fact, it's been demonstrated by some research there in Eastern Europe that beginners not only improve their technique more quickly when they use light weights, but they actually get stronger faster when they train with light, light weights at the beginning of their career. It isn't until later they need to lift heavier ones. You should begin with reps in the 5 to 8 range when you're using a stick or a bar so that you have a lot of opportunity to get an idea of the movement. You drop to 3 to 6 reps when you start to put some weight on the bar and you want to begin to get a sense of the timing and proper movement. Eventually you'll graduate to where you're doing 1 to 2 reps with heavy loads to gain the split second precision you need in weightlifting technique and to prepare for competition. It should be noted that the more complex the exercise, the fewer the repetitions you can do. For example, the clean and jerk, which is really two exercises combined into one, an athlete would never do something like five repetitions, but rather would do one or two or maybe three at the most, or would do a single clean followed by some repetition jerks. You simply get too fatigued if you do clean and jerks together for high repetitions. You should pause somewhere between reps when you're learning, for at least a second anyway, so that your body can process what has happened in the previous rep. If you simply go from one rep to another with no hesitation, it will be a blur to your conscious and subconscious mind and you won't learn as quickly. So you should have some spread between the reps, but not more than a few seconds at most. Now, the coach should be watching for the athlete uh, showing signs of thinking or worrying about the weight and changing technique for signs of fatigue. If that begins to happen, then it's simply too heavy for the athlete at that point in time, and uh, any, note, any drop in speed or precision shows that the weight should be reduced. Most lifters drop the bar after lifting it, a procedure which we'll demonstrate shortly. But knowing how to lower the bar more softly can be useful when one is performing repetitions from the hang or is lifting in a gym that discourages unnecessary bar dropping. The process begins with the lifter bending the knees. Once the bees are bent, then the lifter allows the bar to come to the shoulders, meets the bar, and then absorbs the shock of the bar dropping with bent knees. In lowering the bar in the clean, the lifter bends the legs, allows the bar to come down, and just little with the arms, can catch it on the thighs, and then lower it to the floor. In the snatch, there's a slightly different procedure. Here the lifter lowers it, lowers the bar, bends the legs a little bit to lower the bar, then allows the bar to come down, resists a little with the arms as it falls, and then catches on the thighs, and then lowers it to the platform to finish the lift. When dropping the bar, the key is to keep the body, including the hands and wrists, well behind the bar. In this way, when it bounces back up, it will not hit the lifter's body. When lifting for the blocks, lifters generally lower the bar onto the blocks after each rep, or step well back from the blocks and drop the bar normally, making sure that the bar does not contact the blocks. This is by far the preferred method, but there is another approach when you're using a block, you don't want to drop the bar on the block, particularly on the corner, because then it can fly out of control, bounce back, and hit the lifter. So, for example, if a lift was done using the blocks, and a lifter was afraid that in dropping it, they would hit the corner of the blocks, it would be appropriate to allow the bar to drop behind, even though forward is usually better. That's a much better strategy than to drop the bar forward, have it hit the blocks, and rebound back toward the lifter. Learning how to miss is an important part of learning how to do the sport of weightlifting. It's very much like learning martial arts. You're taught how to fall 
almost the first thing in your learning experience, and that's because you're going to fall, and you want to learn how to fall and not be hurt. Well, similarly, in weightlifting, you want to learn how to miss so that you'll never be fearful of that process. You'll never be concerned about lifting a weight that's heavy. Uh, you'll know what to do to get out from underneath it, and it's really a very simple process, but it takes a little bit of orientation and practice at the beginning to understand it. Always stay between the plates, and if possible, behind the bar whenever you can so the bar is falling forward. Uh, if that fails, then as we illustrated earlier, you can drop the bar behind you, but uh, forward is, is the best uh, where, where it's uh, possible to make an option. Now, the other issue is make sure that the arms are straight. Just as in race car driving, you have a cage to protect your body, in weightlifting, you have straight arms to protect your body. If the arms are held straight, the bar cannot hit the body. If the bar falls forward, then the arms are straight, the bar will fall forward of the body, and prevent the lifter from injury. If the bar drops behind and the lifter keeps the arms straight, the ball will go behind the body, safely out of the way of the lifter. If the arms bend, that's what causes the bar to be able to come down on top of the lifter, and that's a mistake one should never make. So I teach lifters the very first workout how to miss. I have them take an empty bar and throw it down forward, throw it down behind them, keeping those arms locked out so they understand the concept of using the arms to miss the bar. Now I'm going to have Alex demonstrate that. Notice how he pushes the bar out from himself and he pushes himself back using the arms. As long as the arms are straight and between you and the bar no to miss, if the bar, if the balance is shifted behind and the lifter feels they can't keep the bar from dropping behind, again you maintain straight arms and you push the bar behind, let the body jump forward. And again, the ball will not hit you because the arms are protecting the body. The minute you let the arms break, that's when you get it. It's important to know how to miss a clean as well as how to miss a snatch or a jerk. And the basic principle is the same. You use your arms to push yourself away from the bar. But in this case, you don't start with the arms straight. You're starting with the bar on your shoulders. But should you clean the bar, and then you can lose your balance, and you're not able to hold it, you push yourself back out of the way and push the bar forward. Again, it's straightening the arms, it's pushing the arms, which is accomplishing two things. It's pushing the bar away from you, and it's pushing you away from the bar. Missing a jerk safely necessitates a modified strategy due to the split position. The lifter must push. Backward with the arms if you miss it behind you, but to make sure the foot comes out of the way and you step forward when you drop it behind you in the jerk. When missing a jerk forward, one pushes out with the arms and steps back with the front leg to pull it out of the way of the dropping bar. Okay. While weightlifting is a relatively safe sport from among strenuous sports, injuries do occur. And perhaps the primary cause is that lifters will train a little too hard, lift a little too much, and get an overstress injury like a tendonitis from overdoing their training, just as a runner might do from overdoing the mileage that uh, he or she does. Apart from the training, there are some very simple causes for most injuries, and most of them are quite avoidable. One is trying too much weight for your capabilities. Someone should never come in and try heavy weights unless they're trained and prepared for it. Uh, people who get injured with weights very often work in the gym without any proper preparation or warm up properly or try a weight that's well above the maximum, and uh, that's where an injury can occur. Poor technique in lifting is another cause, and that's why we've stressed technique throughout this uh, video, and also inability to miss properly, and no one has taught enough to how to miss properly as we've done, uh, that can be a cause for an injury. Unsafe use of equipment, uh, using it improperly, or using equipment that's worn. Less than full concentration while one is lifting, a very important reason for an injury. A lifter will come in before the round talking to somebody else, not paying attention to what they're doing, and that's when the majority of your injuries occur. You should make it in mind early in your career that when you touch a barbell, you give it 100% concentration. You concentrate absolutely nothing else for the duration of your lift until the bar is back safely on the floor, and you avoid a uh, great many injuries that might otherwise occur. Uh, another problem is lifting well fatigue. If you're tired, either from the prior workout or from the work you've been doing a certain day and your technique is uh, deteriorating, you're finding that your timing and your speed are not what they were, then you should discontinue that exercise. And if you have overall fatigue, then just discontinue the workout. There's no point in training when one is overly fatigued. 
And finally, fighting in this position, lift. When you've lifted a bar overhead, your arms begin to break, and you can't support the bar overhead. As soon as that occurs, push out on the arms and get rid of the bar, just as we showed before in terms of missing the bar. Similarly, when weighted on the shoulders, if it's below a certain point, you don't have your elbows up, it's down here, push away and jump out from under. We taught you how to miss. Use that and do not attempt to fight a weight when it's out of position, when you've lost your balance, or when the arms have uh, bent at all. We've covered a great deal of material in this section of the video about how to learn and teach proper technique. Now it's your job to get in the gym and coach or practice until you've mastered weightlifting technique. Now we want to talk about the equipment that an athlete can wear in weightlifting competition and also in training. Now first of all, there is a minimum amount of equipment you must wear in a weightlifting competition. You must have a lifting suit, similar to this, a one-piece lifting suit, that's an absolute minimum, and you must wear shoes. You're not allowed to lift barefoot. Uh, that would be a big mistake anyway, but it's not, not permitted. Now as far as the shoes themselves, there's a maximum height on the shoe of 130 uh, millimeters. And so the, the shoe top cannot be a very high top kind of a shoe, 130 uh, millimeters is the maximum height. And the sole cannot protrude outside the shoe to try to stabilize the lifter more than five millimeters. So basically the sole has to be in line with the upper of the shoe. It can protrude the five millimeters, a small amount, but that's the uh, maximum. Now in terms of optional equipment, you can wear a pair of trunks under your lifting suit, you can wear an athletic supporter, uh, women can wear a brassiere underneath their uh, lifting outfit, those are all permissible things. When it comes to socks, the weightlifter is permitted to wear socks that extend as high as the bottom of any knee wrap that they wear. There must be a skin space between the two. So you can wear considerably higher socks uh, than Dan has here. And some athletes do that to protect the shins. So when the bar rubs against the body, uh, the sock protects the shins a little bit. You can wear a t-shirt, but the t-shirt cannot have anything that goes uh, beyond the upper arm. It cannot extend to the elbow. You cannot have a shirt and a collar like the one I'm wearing here. That would not be permitted in weightlifting competition. It must be a normal uh, round neck or v-neck kind of a t-shirt in order to be eligible for weightlifting competition. Most lifters, when they're using a hook grip, wrap the thumb in the, this way. They start the tape. Some lifters will go in a continuous motion around the thumb <coughs> and then tear it. I don't like that because the tape tends to bunch up and it's hard to layer it just the right way. So another way that can be uh, used is to do two single layers or two single uh, strips of tape. Wrap it around the thumb in this way. Leave about an inch and then tear at that point and then finish the tape on the first joint of the thumb. Take another layer of tape, overlap just slightly the first layer so there's no bare skin. Again, about an inch, tear, and wrap it around the rest of the thumb, and now you have the thumb well wrapped. Lifters will, when they don't care for the calluses on their hands by keeping them pared down, will tear the calluses. And typically that occurs at the base of one of the fingers. So let's assume that it occurred at the base of my <coughs> second finger, or much my fourth finger. You would take a length of tape, longer than, uh, or double the length of your hand, a little more than double the length of your hand. You take the center of this tape, tear it, make a little bit of a hole. You put your finger through that hole. Get a little bit bigger. Work it all the way down, and now place the tape. And bend the hand back so you know that you have enough of a slack in the tape, so that when you bend the arm back or bend the hand back and the snatch of the clean, you're okay. Put it on the other side of the hand. Um, make sure you can bend that as well. And then take a layer of tape back to your roll of tape, and take a piece long enough to go around the wrist. Secure it uh, at the wrist by going all the way around, having a couple inches to spare. 
And now you've got something protecting your hand that will sustain you for the whole workout. This is a very effective way of doing it. To my knowledge, uh, I'm the one who came up with this approach, although there may be other people who've done it. Um, many lifters, prior to this kind of wrapping approach, and I did myself, if I tore a callus, I would wrap the tape around the hand in this way, trying to protect it. And the problem is the tape will bunch up. You'll, it'll last for a few sets. It'll eventually pull off the, uh, uh, the hand, and uh, it really doesn't work very well. You are permitted to wear a belt, but the belt can't be more than 12 centimeters in width, which is a little over four inches. Most belts fit that description, but a really wide belt would not be allowed in weightlifting competition. Another piece of equipment that is permitted in weightlifting competition and is often used in training is a knee wrap. Now, the rules in weightlifting say that a knee wrap is allowed to be 30 centimeters wide. So from top to bottom, from here to here, 30 centimeters wide, no more than that. However, the wrap can be as long as you want. Now, this particular one is made of neoprene, covered by nylon, keeps the knee warm, but doesn't really offer much in the way of support. Uh, but a lot of athletes like it. This is certainly permissible. You can also use a kind that is made of the same materials, an ace bandage that you commonly see in the drugstore that, that is a kneecap like that. That's permitted in competition. This is a sort of a standard ace bandage kind of a material which can also be used. And there's also a heavier kind of a material that is used mostly in powerlifting competition that uh, is made to support the, um, the athlete. This type of wrap is wrapped around the knee in a special way to provide maximal support. They wrap around the top of the knee to fix it and then do a whole wrapping layers around the knee, come down, <clears throat> and eventually when they've wrapped it fully, and secured at the bottom, they'll come up in what's often referred to as a figure eight, kind of a configuration. This provides significant support for the knee and adds a lot of pounds to the squat. This kind of wrap is definitely not recommended for doing the Olympic lifts, and most Olympic lifters do not use them for squatting either because they don't do the snatch or the clean with such wraps. In addition to restricting one's speed and going under the bar, power wraps bunch up behind the knee, creating a wedge that I believe could lead to knee problems when snatching or cleaning. Another thing that's permitted in weightlifting competition, believe it or not, is a glove. Uh, you can wear a fingerless glove in competition. It's absolutely not recommended. I don't know anybody on a national or international level who does it, uh, but it is permitted now under the rules. I think uh, the hand will slip with a glove on it. Uh, it can bunch up. It's, it's just not something that you want to do, but it is uh, permissible. And the last thing that is permitted is a wrist wrap. Now, <clears throat> there are a number of different varieties. There are some that are elastic, similar to this, and the athlete wraps it around the uh, wrist. I don't like that because it's constantly squeezing on the wrist. It's putting pressure there, cutting the circulation of the hand. Obviously, you can take them on and off between sets. I don't happen to like that uh, particular uh, method of, of wrapping. There's a boxing wrap, which is a piece of material that's rather stiff and supportive. It can be used. It doesn't stretch, so it doesn't put the constant pressure on the wrist. I think that's a better choice. But my favorite is this leather type of a wrist strap. You take the ends of the strap, thread it through the slots that are provided. The strap goes on the, over the hand. And I like to place the strap such that when I tighten this, I'm going to have both the thickness of the wide part of the strap and the two supporting pieces around the part that bothers me. So if my wrist hurts, and, and when I flex it backward, I want this to protect that area. I want to make sure I have that double support at that area. Once you're finished wrapping the um, this strap around, you thread the end of the wrap through the buckle and pull backward until the wrap is uh, fixed on the wrist. But in this kind of a position, this gives tremendous support to the wrist. It's very, very strong. I can easily undo this between sets, 
So I've got uh, circulation freely going in the uh, hand. There's there certain parts of the body that are absolutely are no wraps or supports of any kind permitted. Uh, you're not allowed to have anything on the upper arm supporting the upper arm at all, nothing on the elbows, nothing on the trunk uh, supporting here, nothing underneath the lifting uniform, nothing on the thighs. You can wear your lifting suit, which comes down your thighs, but you can't wear any kind of supportive device uh, on the thighs at all. So those are all things that are not permitted in uh, weightlifting competition. I always recommend that lifters wear a t-shirt and sweatpants when they work out. The t-shirt, because it helps absorb sweat on across the shoulders and chest when the lifter is racking the bar or even squatting with the bar. It helps the bar adhere to the shoulders and stay more securely on the chest. And uh, the sweatpants, because they keep the knees warm in the low weather, even in summer, there may be air conditioning, and you want to make sure you keep your knees and legs warm. But perhaps more importantly, there are going to be abrasions on the shin and the thighs if the lifter doesn't wear the sweatpants to protect those areas when they pull the bar. The bar will glide along the shins and glide along the thighs and may even bounce in some lifters' cases, depending on their style. And so the uh, sweatpants will help protect them from that. And so I you know, <coughs> strongly recommend they wear this. And on the t-shirt, I recommend a cotton t-shirt because the bar will adhere to it better than when you have a polyester, which tends to be a little slippery and it can make the uh, weight slide off the uh, shoulders. Straps can be a very helpful training aid to lifters. They help the lifter hold on to the bar and they can take some of the wear and tear off the hands. This is one design in which the lifter would put the hand through the strap so the strap is uh, against the back of the hand. The strap is then wrapped around the bar in this kind of a fashion. When you get it here, you sort of turn the bar toward you so that it tightens the grip against the bar. You want the hand flush against the bar. Now, another kind of strap that I prefer is this kind of a design. This is a mountain climbing uh, nylon strap, which is a 6,000 pound test. I had it sewed in a crisscross fashion and then in a box by a shoemaker who has a heavy needle and thread machine. I put my hand through the strap. The strap goes around the bar from back to front in this kind of a fashion. And I grip the bar. Again, the strap is pulled tightly against the bar. Now notice the design of this strap. It's short, okay? It only goes around the bar one time. If you have a very long strap and it goes around the bar more than once, there can be a lot of difficulty in releasing the strap when you're doing a snatch or a clean. With this type of a strap, I have it wrapped up. If I miss a lift, I just pull like that. I just take the pressure off my hand, open it up, and the bar slides immediately out so I can get out from under the bar. But if I had this wrapped around the bar with a long leash several times, it would be difficult to get rid of the bar, and we don't want that. So that's the proper design of a strap. Chalk, or magnesium carbonate, is truly a lifter's friend. It helps the lifter grip the bar securely, absorbs any perspiration or oils that may be on the hands. It's applied in this kind of a fashion across the palms and fingers, rubbing the chalk this way. And most lifters will then rub over the back of the thumb because they're using a hook grip and that secures the hook. Chalk can also be applied across the shoulders when one is getting ready to clean or jerk. It helps secure the bar on the shoulders if there's a little perspiration or oil there. It will help and, and even can help the bar adhere to the shirt. So I recommend using chalk in both those ways. A good bar is the most important piece of equipment that a lifter can have. A good bar is straight. One way to tell whether it is or it isn't is to turn the bar and watch the end. Notice on this bar, the end doesn't move as I turn this bar. A bar that's bent, this will flex up and down, it will wobble, it will move around. That's how you can tell, you can look at the center of the bar as well and tell whether it's straight or not. The bar should turn easily. When I push this bar, it keeps turning a little bit after I let it go because it moves freely within the uh, sleeve of the bar. That what I have my hand on here, the bar itself is inside of that, supported by bearings. So a good bar is, is straight, it 
turns easily and it's flexible. It should bend a little as you uh, go to lift it. And the heavier the weight, the more it should bend. Another key piece of equipment is the collar. The collar secures the plates to the bar and it's highly recommended that you use collars at all times. The collar has two main features. One is wing nuts like this or a similar type of method to secure the collar tightly to the bar. You turn these nuts in this fashion and the bar is locked securely, the collar is locked securely against the bar. To tighten the collar the last little bit, there's usually a turning device like this, which compresses the plate against the inside collar and ensures that the plate will not have any wobble. Once these are tightened in this way, you still should be able to turn the bar without any problem if you have a good bar. Squat racks are generally designed to adjust to the lifter's height. They should be set high enough so that the athlete does not have to bend the legs very much to get under the bar. When the lifter straightens his or her legs, the bar should comfortably clear the highest point at the front of the rack. The front of the rack is the part closest to the lifter. The lifter should always face the rack and step far enough back, even a couple steps more than is shown here, so that a missed lift will not hit the rack and bounce back toward the lifter. You don't want the bar so high that it goes over the back of those protective racks and allows the bar to travel outside the safety of the rack. Now, again, Hans constantly faces the rack, steps back from the rack, then walks in and notice how he puts the bar against the uprights before he lowers the bar. He is making sure that the bar is against the rack and then he only has to lower the body vertically. He does not have to worry about leaning forward into the rack. You see a lot of new people when they come to lift, they anticipate the rack, they bend forward, they reach for the rack, they don't walk all the way into the rack and make sure that they're in proper position before they set the bar back uh, on uh, top of the rack. Okay, that's the mistake when they bend forward like that, they get out of position and that can cause an injury, it can cause them to miss the rack. One of the most important versatile pieces of equipment in any weightlifting gym is what's known as a power rack. And now we're going to demonstrate what a power rack is and how it can be used properly. The nice thing about the rack is you have pins going all the way up and down, holes going all the way up and down, and you can set your pin at any height, so we're going to accommodate a lifter of any height. And lifters sometimes use this to do partial uh, deadlifting exercises, partial squatting exercises. It's used to do overhead uh, supporting exercises. There are many special remedial kinds of exercises that can be done in the power rack. Uh, it's certainly not used to do the Olympic lifts themselves. The effective use of the rack requires a pin like this to support the weight. If you notice, there's something on the front to prevent the bar from rolling off. The rack itself prevents it from going further back this way. And this kind of a rack can be used, it's called a cage because of the depth of the rack. It can be used as a spotter. In, in a way when a lifter is performing an exercise, the long set of pins can be used below the rack. We would ordinarily in that situation put this pin here in the uh, inside, the other pin on the inside, and the bar would be placed inside the rack. So the lifter would remove the bar from the rack, perform whatever exercise, set the pins at a position below the bottom of that exercise, and if the lifter were squatting, for example, these pins would be set a little bit lower, just below the lowest point in the squat. So if you miss, you just move away from the bar. The bar is caught by the spotters, and there's no concern about uh, uh, the bar descending on the lifter or getting out of control. So it's a very good exercise, a very good piece of apparatus for someone training alone. But uh, if you have one single piece of uh, equipment that you could buy beyond your barbell and your platform, power rack is right up there in terms of the kinds of thing you want to have to, uh, to do your assistance exercises. Its versatility is uh, enormous and the durability is great. If you have a good solid rack like this with heavy steel, uh, it'll last a lifetime. So uh, it's a great investment. Another piece of apparatus that lifters use in their training is the height gauge. The idea of the height gauge is to measure how high an athlete is pulling the bar when doing high pulls. 
Uh, I like this kind of device because lifters can tend to do their high pull exercise. If they don't have a goal or an objective as they're doing it, they can tend not to pull as hard as they really should. And the main and feature of this height gauge is that you have this uh, dowel rod again. You drill holes into various heights so that you can uh, have the right height that you're measuring. And then there's this device, which is the device that's actually doing the measuring. And the way it works is that there's a spring at the base and the spring is what gets inserted in the hole in the uh, device and the spring lets the little dowel rod which is what uh, determines or what measures the height of the pull move freely so if the athlete exceeds the height instead of if this were rigid the athlete might pop it out of the plate or break the stick but with the spring on the end of it in this way the stick can come up. Now you can put a little bell on the end of this so that the athlete knows they're hitting the gauge, there's a little noise. I've designed the upright of this height gauge so that it fits into any standard bumper plate. There's no dowel rod standardly made that is the proper diameter so I've added a piece of pipe and some tape to thicken the end and make it fit securely into the plate. Another device that can be used as a height gauge, and actually the first one that I ever saw was developed by Tommy Cono, one of the world's greatest lifters who represented the United States for many years, and also one of the most renowned coaches in the world. He would take two squat racks, place a stick across the racks, put a rubber band at one or both ends of the stick to keep it from jumping off the racks when it was uh, hit during the pull. And this apparatus, as with a height gauge, any height gauge be used, in this kind of a fashion. The end of the bar is what you want to measure the height of, so the lifter might pull this way and try to hit the height gauge. Okay? Now, it's important when doing this exercise not to use the arms or to stretch the body overly so that one is hitting the maximum height of the pull but creating an artificial kind of a technique. You want to pull in the way you normally would and then let the bar rise by momentum rather than making it go the rest of the way. So if you finish your explosion here in the pull, that's where you want to finish it when you're practicing this exercise and then you're going to let the bar rise up. So and it goes up. I'm not pulling with my arms. I'm using my toes or my arms to raise the bar any further. I'm snapping here and the bar is rising up as a result of that. Spiders are not generally used on the Olympic list because the lifters have learned how to miss. However, they are used on other exercises. Spotters should always be used when a lifter squats or bench presses. When one spotter is being used in the squat, it is narrow to pull on the bar as this can cause a lifter to lose his or her balance. Okay. A better strategy for one person spot is to put the hands on the sides of the lifter's torso and pull up in the direction that the ball would otherwise be moving when one is doing the spot. A two or three person spot is the spot of choice for the squat. The spotter should be alert and close to the bar, but only touch it when the lifter says take it or has hit a sticking point in the lift, stops, and begins to descend. When there are two spotters, they must coordinate their efforts, thus one lift up more quickly than the other, placing the lifter in a dangerously uneven position. Many spotters feel they should help a lifter through each rep in the squat or a similar lift. Since the greatest training benefit comes from fighting through a sticking point, this is generally counterproductive. When one is teaching athletes the Olympic lifts in order to improve their performance as athletes in another sport, there are some coaches who will teach the lift of the full lifts, the squat snatch, and the squat clean. But many of them teach either a power clean or a power snatch to build up the athlete's explosive power. And that's fine. But if you have an athlete who doesn't have the ability to rack the ball properly or they're making terrible technical mistakes leaning back, that athlete might be much better off doing high pulls. And they get a great share of the benefit that they would derive from power cleans, but the high pulls would not cause them to assume the poor position. When you're doing high pulls, an athlete would use a height gaze to give them an idea of their progress. And finally, if an athlete can't do a full pull from the floor, doesn't have the flexibility to reach down on the floor, then do a partial pull, do a pull from above the knees. And again, you'll get a large percentage of the benefit from doing explosive lifts by practicing that. Weightlifting is the most challenging and exciting sport in the world. It tests your mental and physical strength and your skill in a way that no other sport does. It provides you with immediate feedback on how you're doing. You can train alone or with a team. You can live for yourself or for your country. You don't rely on the questionable point scoring or other calls of a referee. If you lift the barbell within the rules, it will be recognized as a good lift. 
You should have a coach, but champions have emerged without one. And the choice of a coach is completely up to you. The sport tests your intellect in developing programs and techniques to help you lift more. You can compete against someone of your own size, age, and gender, but win or lose, everyone, regardless of his or her ability, has his or her moment in the spotlight during competition, and everyone can be a winner in terms of personal development. Or lifting offers you the opportunity to build a career around your sports abilities and interests. Natural talent is a smaller factor in weightlifting success than it is in perhaps any other sport. You build yourself into a strong and skilled athlete by your efforts. Yes, with proper training, everyone can become truly strong. And you can participate in weightlifting for your entire life, except when medical conditions prohibit that. You can stand many of the ravages of time on, on a human body. It's as close to a fountain of youth as anything you can find. You can make friends all over the world and keep them for life. In summary, you can test the limits of your mind and your body in a truly unique way and join so many others in achieving the joy that comes from working hard to achieve your full potential. And for those of you with the discipline and devotion and imagination, there is a potential for Olympic gold. Whatever your aspirations, be they modest or great, with all the benefits that are yours for the training, don't put it off. Become a weightlifter. Do it today. And once you've started, continue this grand activity for all of your tomorrows. Get strong. Stay strong for life. To obtain additional copies of the Weightlifting Encyclopedia book or video, please contact us at this address or phone number. And please visit our website for more information on the sport of Olympic-style weightlifting. We urge you to join the governing body for weightlifting in the United States, the USAW, and to contact the International Weightlifting Federation at iwf.net to learn more about international weightlifting.